All right. Good morning. This is the Colorado Energy and Carbon Management Commission. It is Wednesday, August 16th, 2023, and this is our normal Wednesday business agenda. We will start with a roll call of commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Ackerman. Here. Commissioner Cross. Present. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Oath. Commissioner Ray. Here. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have six out of seven commissioners present. Thank you. Uh, we will proceed into our agenda. We have a lengthy agenda today and possibly running into tomorrow. Uh, the first matter on our agenda is a time for commissioner to provide any comments for the, the good of the calls on the ECMC. Does any commissioner have comments? Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually have a couple of comments. The first is I'm just following up on the pitting missions work group recommendations. So um, we all got a presentation two weeks ago and said we would give folks time to give public comment um, and none yet to date. And so I think at this point, um, the next step would be maybe a general thumbs up from the commissioners to start moving forward with those recommendations, I think, Mr. Chair. Um, so I don't know if that officially needs to be on a future agenda or how you want me to handle that. I don't know if it's official voting or just a general like this looks good. Yeah. Let's move forward. I think it might. We might be better served if we put it on an agenda so that folks know that it's coming up. Um, and I believe that AAG Davenport just visualized. Would you like to provide some perspective? Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Commissioner. McGowan, I was going to um, chime in to suggest, I think the direction that you were already headed, Chair, um, is to get it on an agenda. Okay, hey, why don't we do this? Um, why don't we direct staff to uh, put this on a future agenda? And then that way the public will know that we're taking something up and we're gonna give formal direction uh, from commission. Uh, Commissioner McGowan, is that comfortable with you? Yes, thank you. And then um, I just wanted also to announce or remind folks that the Colorado Energy Office is working on the greenhouse gas map roadmap 2.0, and they're taking written comments right now, and you can go to their website and see the various um, kind of short term near term actions that they've proposed for different kind of different kinds of industry groups, <laughs> um, and you can provide written comment there. And then my last comment is. Um, I am chairing the biochar advisory group uh, from legislation from this year, and the kickoff meeting will be August 28th. I am working on uh, getting a Zoom meeting put together. Angelica and I are doing a little training, and then I will work with meeting to Megan to post that on our site. So if you want to uh, listen in uh, to the kickoff meeting, um, that will be on the 28th. Awesome. Great comments. Thank you. Other commissioners with comments? Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to give a brief update on geothermal. Uh, as the commission knows, the commission has been tasked with uh, managing and regulating deep geothermal operations in Colorado pursuant to legislation this year. Uh, we have been working diligently, as has the Colorado Energy Office, DNR, and, and many others, on helping that take shape. We've been meeting with focus groups and are working with staff as well on the content of the uh, proposed rules that we would hope to bring up later this fall. And so we'll continue to meet with uh, focused stakeholder groups to draft rules through the remainder of August and September with the intent of putting out an actual straw dog draft of rules to the public towards the end of September, uh, which would then uh, under our current schedule, uh, begin a potential rulemaking process this November on geothermal. Wanted to specifically recognize Mike Rigby from our staff, a geothermal coordinator amongst other duties that he has. He's been working uh, very diligently on this issue uh, together with Ben Boudreau from the Attorney General's office who's doing the majority of the drafting. So appreciate that and also appreciate the director's involvement on working on this issue. Again, hoping for rulemaking in November and we certainly will keep uh, the commission up to date on our progress. Excellent. Other commissioners with comments? All right, seeing none, uh, we now will move to 
uh, public comment. Um, and give me just a sec. I had printed out my public comment sheet and I can't find it. Bear with, hold on. It changed as of this morning, so. Okay, um, general, so we've got uh, two public comment sessions this morning. One is gonna be a general public comment. And then the second public comment section is going to be on docket 23040117. That's the KPK financial assurance plan. Um, we've got folks signed up for both general public comment and then for that public comment. So we'll start with general public comment. Uh, and uh, the first person on the list is Jennifer Parenti, uh, Representative General Parenti. So if we could bring her to the Zoom meeting, uh, remind everybody we've got three minutes each for public comment. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Good morning. Did that work? It does. Great. And I think for clarification, I am here specifically to speak about the docket that you referred to. Oh, okay. Um, it, can you can you hold for a second, uh, Rep. Parenti, because I'm trying to get all the general public comment, um, and then I'll go into KPK, and I'm going to open up that docket. So we're going to unvisualize you for a moment, and you'll be first on the KPK docket. I've got two other people that are speaking generally, so let me go to them first, and uh, no thank you for the patience. All right, then we would now hear from Mark Glenn for general public comment. Okay, folks, I'm unmuted. You can hear me now? We can hear you, yes. That's great. Okay, so um, thanks for having us here today to comment. Thanks for being here and listening to our comments and being part of our community and fellow community members alongside us. Um, I, my name is Mark Glenn. I live here in Boulder. I've been in Colorado for 30 years now, and I'm an outdoor enthusiast. I am... Um, I bicycle, I hike, I hunt, I swim. I'm outdoors all the time. And I'm very concerned about the, the regulation uh, that was proposed for oil and gas. Um, this, I'll call it the security deposit, although I know that's not the proper terminology, but uh, um, the $100,000 that would be put into a bond for oil and gas so that when they're uh, completed with their wells, finished extracting, that that money would be an incentive for them to uh, clean up the area properly, cap the well properly. And uh, recently saw that that was negotiated down to approximately $8,000. And I'm just crushed because there's just no chance that $8,000 is going to cover the cost of reclaiming that land. You know, we have a huge issue here. In the 30 years I've been here, you know, I have asthma now. I have issues breathing my eyes. And uh, I'm not the only one. And more and more research is uh, coming out showing that methane is incredibly bad for the environment, much worse than CO2. And I'm just really pleading with the regulators to please uh, Take a look at our, our past, our history of mining and what the miners left behind. Um, we have such an opportunity here on so many fronts to keep our environment clean, to have integrity in how we regulate uh, extraction because we're looking out for one another. We're looking out for the environment. Obviously we're in a crisis with our environment and we have an opportunity here to make um, people accountable for using the land and using it properly and I'm just really pleading with you to put this regulation in place where it's $100, sorry, $100,000 that each extractor is responsible for putting up front. And I'm positive as, one, as someone who has rented and put a security deposit down, I'm positive that would incentivize them to do the right thing. And also then of course, we'll have to figure out what loopholes they can get around in order to keep that well uh, from being quote unquote, uh, no longer in use. But the point is that now is the time, it's more crucial than ever that we clean up our environment, especially with the uh, quote unquote orphaned wells that are leaking methane with the roads, 
and the pad sites. Um, all you have to do is fly above Colorado and look down and it looks like prairie dog holes everywhere. So thanks for hearing me out. Uh, I hope I've had a little impact uh, on behalf of all of us citizens who wish that um, uh, the extractors would be accountable. And I'm once again, I'm, I'm begging you to please uh, be really tough on this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Glenn. Um, I, I am curious, I, I don't know what you're referring to, where there's been a reduction of financial assurance to $8,000. So I would encourage you to touch base with our staff about that, because that's not true. Um, oh. we, we have very vigorous financial assurance protocol in place. It's probably one of the strongest in the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, uh, there are various methods for achieving financial assurance. All of them are protective. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know what you're referring to, but uh, that would be incorrect. But we do thank you for your time and taking time out of your day and coming to us. And we obviously uh, appreciate trying to make sure everybody understands the correct information around the strong financial assurance plans that we have in the state of Colorado. So thanks. Okay, uh, thanks. We now will hear from Fred Mallow. And I would note um, for our speakers, uh, if you are able to see our screen, we have the three minute timer set up and uh, we encourage folks to try to keep within that three minutes so that we can hear from everybody. And I think we're looking for Mr. Mallow. Uh, Hearings Manager Amaro, I'm not seeing Mr. Mallow in the docket. Do you see him? Are you able to find him? We have been looking and we are not able to find him, Mr. Chair. Okay, then let's uh, let's keep moving. Um, that was the two people that, there were three people that, or two, I guess, because Rep. Parente is going to speak to KPK. So at this point, what we will do is we will um, receive public comment on docket 23040117 uh, to the extent that it's necessary. I hereby open that document docket for purposes of public comment. Uh, commissioners, my idea here is that we would have public comment. Um, we would then close the docket. And then we've got a couple of other business matters before we get to that docket later this morning or this afternoon. And at that point, we would reopen the docket. Um, so with that, uh, we now would call upon Rep. Uh, Parenti um, to rejoin us and provide public comment on uh, the KBK docket. Hello again. Good morning again. How are you? We are good. All right. Glad to have you. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to address the commission today. Uh, for the record, I am State Representative Jennifer Parenti. I serve the people of East Boulder County and Southwest Weld. And I am speaking to you in support of two communities in my district, the town of Frederick and the city of Decono, regarding their petition you will hear later today concerning the financial assurance plan for KB Kaufman. First, I wanted to be clear that oil and gas development is an important part of our local economy and the majority of our district supports safe extraction operations. But with that support comes an expectation that industry will take full responsibility for its activities. And unfortunately, KPK has repeatedly failed to live up to those expectations. Orphaned and abandoned wells are an epidemic here in District 19. They emit harmful toxins into our air, soil, and water. They prevent my communities from executing plans for growth and eventually become a burden on the taxpayers who are left literally cleaning up the mess left behind by irresponsible actors. And as you know, under current rules, operators are expected to set aside at least $130,000 for each low and non-producing well. But my understanding is that the proposed plan would require less than a third of that to be secured for the wells currently operated by KPK in our district. We are small towns here in Southwest Weld. Frederick has a population of just over 16,000, Decono half that. And with nearly 100 KPK wells needing cleanup in Frederick alone, our communities simply don't have the means to pick up where industry neglects. And in fact, previously reported spills and leaks by this same operator are still unremediated here, years after they were first identified. There is no backup when industry doesn't comply. So it's our assessment that now is not the time to cut KPK a deal or give them the benefit of the doubt. 
This company has repeatedly failed to demonstrate a commitment to the health and safety of the residents of my district and others across the state. And in my opinion, this proposal should be seen as nothing short of a symptom, not a cure of the profits over prop people mentality that led the state to revoke KPK certificate to operate in the first place. Uh, so I just conclude by saying the people of District 19 are relying on you to protect us both physically and financially from irresponsible actors in this industry and suggest that until we see actual changed behavior that demonstrates a true commitment to safer and cleaner operations and not just a promise of words and numbers on paper, we have to ensure that KPK is held to the strictest possible scrutiny. So on behalf of the residents of my district, I strongly urge you to reject the current proposal and require KPK to submit a revised plan that will provide for the highest levels of security and protection under state law. Uh, we are counting on you to help protect our communities. And thank you. Thank you for the time to address you today. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, Rep. Prenti, I would also note for the record that we received written public comments uh, from you. Um, and we've met, ensured that those were placed into the administrative record. So thanks very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now we've got uh, Jan Rose, and I'm going to start letting people know kind of who's on deck and who's in the hole. Uh, Heidi Leithwood is on deck, and then it would be Lynn Sullivan. So we'd bring Miss Rose to the table. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you um, for um, allowing public comment on this docket. I believe uh, my, my name is Jan Rose. I live in the ozone capital of the state where the ozone meters consistently um, consistently show higher readings than any place else in the state, including in Weld County. I live in Jeffco where there's no fracking, but we are downwind of all the fracking. Um, so, um, I am so disappointed with this docket. I think the commission probably is as well. The original financial assurance plan was, I, I believe, in keeping with the regulations and sufficiently protective of the public health, safety, welfare, environment, and wildlife resources. Um, we, uh, we keep chasing this scoff law bad actor around and around, and I have not seen any demonstration of good faith on behalf of this operator in the four years that I've been engaged in uh, commission business. The um, current proposal that you'll be considering today is the lowest amount of financial assurance to date. And as Representative Parenti said, we can look at the spill reports and see that there is so much soil and water contamination um, that goes on for months and it's from their wells and it's from their tank batteries and it's from their flow lines. It's just pervasive. And so the idea that we can effectively, uh, well, we could certainly plug them for a relatively low cost, but the remediation of reclamation is going to be extraordinarily painful for the state to take on. And KPK gives every appearance of intending to stiff the taxpayers of Colorado at the end of the line. Um, I know you're embroiled in court proceedings and your hands are a little bit tied up here, but I urge you to uh, demand the highest amount of bonding possible. Um, it's really in the best interest of the mission of the uh, ECMC and uh, we are way past mitigating and avoiding adverse impacts. We are gonna have really substantial adverse impacts as a result of this operator. We need lots of reclamation remediation money to clean it up. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Rose. We now will hear uh, from Heidi Leithwood, followed by Lynn Sullivan. All right. I think we're having trouble finding Ms. Leithwood. Uh, I do believe we've got Alexis Schwartz, who I inadvertently skipped um, I, and apologize for that. Sorry, I think I've been promoted to a panelist now. This is Heidi Leithwood. Should I go ahead? Yes, absolutely. And um, hearings manager Amaro, if we could bring in Alexis Schwartz for the next speaker, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'll turn on my video too. 
Thank you, and hello, commissioners. Thanks for taking the public comment today. I'm Heidi Leithwood, Climate Policy Analyst with 350 Colorado. I'm here today to comment on the financial assurance hearing for KP Kaufman. I have a short and very non-technical comment today. Um, KP Kaufman has an egregious record of violations, bills, and failure to remediate in a timely manner. It has shown it is not likely to follow the rules and not likely to do what it says it will do. This operator should not be given any discretion when it comes to financial assurances, and it should be held to the full financial assurances required by your rules under option four. Remembering back to the enforcement hearings of a year or two ago, KPK claimed that they were incapable of paying the penalties assessed by your enforcement staff. And yet now they would have you believe they are financially stable enough to be a low risk operator, able to design their own plan and not pay all of the single well financial assurance required by your rules under option four. And with regard to that enforcement hearing, I'm sure you don't need reminding either that they either willfully refused to comply with your orders or were incapable of doing so. They continue to show they do not do what they say they're going to do. We urge you to reject KPK's current proposal and instead require the highest financial assurances required by your rules, and also to require a portion of their wells to be plugged, not only for the jurisdictions who have come forward as parties or by submitting comments, such as the towns of Frederick, the city of Tacano and Adams County, but for all wells statewide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony and spending time with us this morning. Uh, we now will recognize Alexis Schwartz, and then following Ms. Schwartz is Lynn Sullivan and then Kevin Chan. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Alexis Schwartz. I'm the conservation organizer at the Colorado Sierra Club, speaking on my own behalf today. I urge you to require KPK to take responsibility for paying its fair share by making it pay the cost of cleaning up its wells. The amount proposed by KPK for plugging, abandoning, and reclaiming each well is not only grievously low, but it also is well below the per well cost estimates provided by ECM staff that includes 100,000 average per well for reclamation. To allow KPK to pay such an inadequate amount toward its eventual well cleanup costs would be a great disservice to Colorado taxpayers who would be on the hook for paying the remainder. Industry should not be allowed to continue privatizing its profits while socializing its costs. Operators must factor in well cleanup as a cost of doing business. Both commonly held societal beliefs about personal responsibility and state regulatory rules require this. The ECMC adopted its financial assurances rules touted as the best of the nation in 2022, but have they truly taken effect? The ruling on KPK will tell. KPK is a bad actor in the state of Colorado. Its financial assurance plan submitted is in the style of its prevailing pattern of regulatory violations. Additionally, this pro problematic operator already prolongs properly retiring more than 1,200 wells in Colorado that produce an average of less than a barrel a day. In the meantime, before those wells are properly plugged and abandoned, they continue to emit methane, a powerful greenhouse gas that's over 20 are 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide at trapping heat in our atmosphere. A study published last year found that low producing oil and gas wells represent about 50% of methane emissions from all US oil and gas well sites, a disproportional amount of emissions, considering that those wells account for only 6% of total oil and gas production in the country. I urge the ECMC to adhere to its obligation to state financial assurance rules by requiring KP Kaufman to pay the amounts required toward the eventual cleanup of its wells. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schwartz. We appreciate you being with us and providing testimony this morning on this matter. We now will recognize Lynn Sullivan, followed by Kevin Chan. Hello, sorry for the difficult backlight. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to speak with you today. My name is Lynn Sullivan and I am a concerned citizen who lives in Longmont. I work outdoors and I have been finding on these 
hotter summer days. By the time I'm back home again, I'm I'm almost incapacitated. I'm just so exhausted. And I've noticed a correlation between high pollution days and uh, my levels of exhaustion. Of course, the heat exacerbates it as well. And so um, much of what the previous speaker just said, I would like to say in brief, because it's part of my reasoning, uh, we know this study that says that 50% of methane emissions are coming from these low producing wells. And KPK has, as was mentioned, um, more than 1,200 of such wells that are producing less than a, a barrel of oil a day. So they are directly contributing to my inability to be and work outdoors and remain functional afterwards. Um, and as we all know, the ECMC staff estimated the cost to plug clean and restore pads and access roads and flow lines to be approximately $100,000. And we also are hearing and seeing that without substantial financial assurances paid by companies, there's not much incentive to follow through with actual complete and thorough cleanup, resulting in increasing the pollution in all of our airs, wherever it is the wind happens to take it, and uh, causing a tremendous burden um, for the, the financial burden for Colorado taxpayers. So um, my realization is that KPK's proposal is in direct violation with the rules that the ECMC passed um, around the financial assurance policies. The, these rules were passed to protect human health and safety, the environment and wildlife resources. So with this in mind, I am asking you please to adhere to the state mandates and require oil and gas companies to pay significant cleanup funds upfront before beginning a drilling project. And I thank you for your work and for your time and for caring about our health. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Appreciate your taking time out of your day to be with us today. Uh, thank you for the comments. We now will hear from Kevin Chan, followed by Brent Goodlett. Hello, my name is Kevin Chen. I want to thank the commission for allowing me to speak today. I have watching, I have been watching over the past year as a concerned taxpayer and resident, um, the ECMC trying to hold KPK accountable. La last year, the federal government had set aside $70 million of uh, cap leaking wells in Colorado alone, $4 billion um, throughout the, the United States. If we are to protect public health environment, we cannot allow an operator to continue skirting its responsibilities. We have taxpayers and residents expect the ECMC to do its job and protect us from emissions and financial costs by, left by bad actors. If the EC, uh, ECMC does not require adequate financial assurances, I as a taxpayer and resident have no, have no, no, no belief that the ECMC can regulate oil and gas. Um, I am really just tired of taxpayers having to shell out money for bad actors and time after time we have seen KPK, you know, at every corner skirt its responsibilities and its untimely cleanup is just inexcusable. I cannot continue to believe that the state is being regulated when we see bad actors um, acting on, acting with ill intent with just having residents and taxpayers covered the financial costs. Thank you for letting me speak today. You're muted, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chan. We now will recognize Brent Goodlett, followed by Emily Arano. Mr. Chair, we've been looking for Mr. Goodlett and we cannot find him. All right. Well, let's keep looking. Uh, let's keep going down the list. Uh, do we? Are you able to find Emily Arano? followed by Tom Delahanty. Emily, is Dr. Emily Arano, she's in, as a panelist. Dr. Arano, um, if you wanna unmute, we can, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Mr. Delahanty, do you want to unmute? We can go ahead and hear from you and then we'll come back to Ms. D Dr. Arano. Sure, I'm happy to present. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Tom Delahanty, and I'm an attorney with Earth Justice. Thanks for the chance to speak today. 
I urge you to reject KPK's attempt to reduce its financial assurance obligations based on the supposed demonstrated costs that it provided in its July 21st supplemental filing, and particularly its claim to reclamation cost of $7,834 per well, uh, which, by the way, I believe is what Mr. Glenn was referring to earlier. The reason for this request is simple. KPK is a high-risk operator, and any error in its plugging and reclamation estimates will be borne by the state. As some of you may remember, the last time I participated in a hearing before this commission was during the financial assurances rulemaking. So I'm keenly aware that option four was intended to be a backstop for high-risk operators. Given that, it's critical that option four be implemented rigorously and with skepticism and caution. That is especially so here with this operator in particular. KBK's production averages less than one BOE per day per well across its portfolio of over 1,200 wells in the state. And in the past two years, it's plugged just 16 wells, or about 1% of its total. As others have stated, it's also no secret that KBK has historically been a bad actor. And just to give some numbers there, since June 2014, KBK has incurred 141 NOAVs and 142 registered complaints. And as you all know, it's currently involved in litigation regarding unfulfilled cleanup obligations. Simply put, Colorado officials have been fighting an uphill battle against KPK on compliance for years. So this history calls for further skepticism and conservatism in setting bond amounts under option four. When the financial assurances rulemaking concluded last year, I knew that the rule's success or failure would depend on its implementation. So if option four, which is the final backstop against the highest risk operators, is interpreted to require just $7,834 per well, and reclamation costs for a notoriously difficult operator based on self-reported and self-serving information, the ECMC will have a difficult time claiming that its rules are, quote, the strongest in the nation. Please reject KPK's proposed financial assurance amounts and instead require the full financial assurance amounts contemplated under option four. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Delahanty, for being with us and taking time out of your day to present. We appreciate it. Uh, Emily Arano, are you able to unmute? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank Great. you. Um, I'm just a concerned taxpayer in Denver and I want to urge the commission to value the taxpayer's health and safety and reject the proposal that KPK uh, is asking for for a reduced um, deposit and have and charge them the full amount because they've shown to be bad actors. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testifying to us this morning on this matter. Uh, are we able to find Mr. Um, Goodlett? Looks like we're still looking for him. Okay, uh, we'll keep looking. Uh, Aaron Grant is next on our list. Yes, hi, good morning, uh, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'll be brief. Um, I'm a residential real estate uh, developer in Frederick, Colorado. Um, I have, uh, I currently own and am designing uh, real estate um, residential lots uh, that are negatively impacted by several uh, KPK wells. Um, I have had uh, negotiations and um, business relations with K KPK in the sense that um, most recently, um, I had a conflict with some storm sewer uh, with two of their uh, gas lines. And um, in my easement agreement, I felt like it was fairly clear that uh, the responsibility of lowering the lines uh, was KPK's responsibility. However, they disagreed and uh, I wasn't in a position to fight. So uh, I ended up getting a bid from them to lower uh, two gas lines um, uh, maybe a couple hundred feet in length uh, in order to uh, alleviate this conflict uh, of future storm sewer. And um, their bid was just under $200,000 uh, to lower these lines. Um, they, I, they allowed me to bring in my own contractor and I was able to get that total cost down to about $130,000. Um, however, it was a, a major cost impact. And, uh, and so uh, I'm hearing the other uh, comment, public comments about lowering lines and, and, and associated cost or, or, or actually reclam reclamation and getting rid of some of these feeder lines. And um, I think the costs are far in excess of the numbers that I'm hearing thrown around based on my you know, most recent experience. Um, the other thing I'll mention is uh, I've 
preliminarily they've negotiated a, a, a buyout uh, of, of two of the wells that are impacting my land. Uh, the going rate right now is 250,000 per well, and that's not including reclamation. Um, if they, if they, if I want KPK to to uh, abandon the lines, remove the lines, and uh, and and deal with any environmental outfall, uh, that is an undetermined number on top of the 250,000. So, um, I guess I would urge the the commission to reconsider. I don't know where these numbers are coming from in terms of providing. Um, um, from KPK's point of view, but uh, the ones they are quoting me are, 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 are far higher. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant. I appreciate you being with us and for taking time out of your day to testify. Uh, we now will recognize Kate Christensen, followed by Erica Delaney Liu. Hi, Commission. Long time no see. My name is Kate Christensen. I live in Lafayette, Colorado. Um, I'm just speaking for myself, but I was working for 350 Colorado during the financial assurances rulemaking, which most of you, I don't think I know Commissioner Ray, but, and I don't think Commissioner Ackman or Cross were part of that process, but I know Commissioner, or Chair Robbins, Commissioner Messner, uh, Commissioner McGowan, remember that well. Um, I think specifically to the docket, what Mr. Grant just said is all the information you need but I wanted to bring to your attention what this looks like from the outside. Um, we participated in that rulemaking for months and months and months for hundreds and hundreds of hours. We didn't have a lawyer. We had me, uh, and I'm trained as a speech language pathologist, to, and we had dozens of volunteers. We were representing thousands of Colorado taxpayers who are concerned about the air they breathe. They're not the oil and gas company profiteering from this. And looking at what KP Kaufman's proposing is insulting to all the work that we put in to put these financial assurances forward. And I really hope, I really hope the commission does not let them get away with it. Because if they do, why would anybody participate in the process? Um, I heard Commissioner Ackerman talking about the upcoming geothermal rulemakings, but if the voices of anyone that's not industry doesn't matter, then why participate? Obviously, I'm here. I believe our voices still matter. Otherwise, I would not be here speaking today. But just take a minute to look at what this looks like from outside of industry, because it's incredibly disheartening and insulting to all of us at our time. So anyway, I just wanted to put in my two cents. Thanks again for your time. Thanks for being here, Ms. Christensen. We always appreciate your comments. Um, okay, we now have Erica Delaney Liu. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Uh, thank you very much for hearing public comment today. My name is Erica Delaney Liu, and I'm a senior assistant city attorney for the city of Thornton. I can keep my comments pretty brief today, having just two points I want to make. Um, KP Kaufman owns or operates 24 wells in the city of Thornton. One of these we already know has a contamination issue, and this is uh, the North Quebec well 12-8 API 05001094434. So we have a known contamination issue that was discovered in June of 2021 and KP Kaufman has failed to follow through with completing or providing documentation of the required remediation. Um, they've used stalling tactics to drag this out for more than two years, and this is happening at the expense of the landowners, surface owners, and the city has a project in that area. So I would ask the commission to look back to our written comments filed on behalf of the city on May 15th, 2023, and I request that the commission in its decision in this docket make it clear to KP Kaufman that they'll be held accountable. Second, I just wanna point out that the city is in agreement with the written public comments filed by Adams County dated uh, August 14th, 2023, and we support Adams County's request that the commission impose and require additional measures and conditions on the application from KP Kaufman. So thank you very much for your time and consideration, um, and that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Liu, you were testifying on behalf of 
the city of Thornton and not yourself personally. Is that correct? That's correct. And our written comments were filed back in May. Um, so we just wanted to draw your attention back to those. Um, we thought the hearing would happen June, July. There was some delay, but um, yes. So I just really wanted to make sure that that it, I know you guys are going to look at the whole record, um, but this has been dragging out longer than we had expected. So <laughs> thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. And thanks for that clarification. Okay, um, we on uh, we had Brent Goodlett who had signed up, um, but we're not able to find him for public comment. And then we had Fred Mallow sign up for general public comment, and we're not able to find him either. Um, however, we have gone through the rest of the public comment uh, for oral public comment. And so um, I do want to read into the record that we received written public comment from several individuals. And just so the record is correct, um, written public comment is from Kate Merlin, KK Duvier, D-U-V-I-V-I-E-R, Marilyn Ayers, Francis Hudry, Marsha Goldsmith, Kathy Durham, Cynthia Sadler, Joan Rowland, Lynn Strasberg, Aaron Gray, and as I mentioned previously, Representative Jennifer Parenti had written public comments as well. So those written public comments are uh, part of the record. Um, that takes care of the public comment portion of our agenda. We now will proceed into the next agenda item, which is consent agenda. Uh, this is a item in which we have uh, non-controversial matters that are up for potential approval by commissioners. Uh, does any commissioner have questions with regard to consent? Seeing no questions, uh, do we have a motion to approve consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve consent. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Uh, consent agenda is uh, passes. Um, next, uh, we have docket 22110309 and oil and gas development plan. Why don't we take five minutes and let staff get the appropriate folks all lined up in the Zoom panel and let's return at 9.51. Uh, all right, uh, we are back. Uh, this is the Colorado Energy and Carbon Management Commission, Wednesday, August 16th agenda. We are now teed up for docket 22110309, an oil and gas development plan. The applicant is St. Croix operating. Uh, it is entitled the Dune OGDP. And I believe um, to get started, uh, there is a reference for public comment, but we do not have public comment um, on this OGDP. Uh, if I'm wrong on that, somebody pipe up. Seeing no piping, uh, we now will hear from St. Croix, uh, Mr. McGowan. Good morning, Mr. Chair. How are you, sir? Good morning. Uh, Commissioner, um, I'm sorry, AAG Mercer is also recognized. You're muted, AAG Mercer. Always with the mute issues, I apologize, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to see if you would like me to swear in St. Croix's witnesses at this time. Yeah, that that would be, that would be appropriate. Um, Mr. McGowan, uh, is Ms. Donahue your only witness? Uh, at this time, uh, yes, Mr. Chair. We have um, some folks on standby for questions. I don't know if you want to swear them in or not, but uh, generally speaking, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Donahue will be the primary witness. Okay, A.G. Mercer, let's do the uh, swearing in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Donahue, if I could just have you raise your right hand, state your name, and say that you swear to tell the truth. Good morning. My name is Jessica Donahue, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. And it, it might be mo most efficient to also have the other um, folks from St. Croix get sworn in, just so that we don't have to stop mid-questioning to do that. Do you folks could? I don't see that they're part of the panel. Um, that's okay. We just we, wait and um, handle it at that time, then. 
Sorry, Miss Mercer. I know they got the link. Um, we appreciated staff. They sent it out last night. So yeah, if, if 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 they pop up or if issues pop up, I guess we can do it then. Okay, let's just do it then. Um, it appears that Miss Donahue is going to be the primary witness for the in terms of the presentation. Uh, if we get to a point where we're needing other witnesses for questions and answers, we'll uh, take care of that at that point in time. Re please remember to remind us, Miss Mercer. Thank you. Okay, I see your screen sharing. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. It's it's good to see you this morning. Um, my name is Chris McGowan. I'm attorney uh, representing St. Croix Operating Incorporated. We are doing the Dune OGDP application. Um, as mentioned by Chair Robbins, uh, Ms. Donahue from Ardor Environmental is, is here today. She's the primary regulatory consultant and will be doing most of the heavy lifting on the, on the, per, on the substance of the permit. Um, as also noted, we have some subject matter experts um, if needed. Um, Mr. Paul Melanchenko is the president of St. Croix Operating and a geologist, and his son David um, is a technical geologist. And then Mr. Olds was the landman on the project, and Mr. Dornbos is the petroleum engineer. Um, so we're going to start just with a brief over, overview, um, St. Croix operate, and, and then we are going to go into the project overview today. We'll, we'll give you an overview of what the permit is, where it's located. Um, we have a timeline rolled out for you today. We'd like to give you details on the location and details of the development itself, um, the operations behind it, and the best management practices, and a brief summary, and then obviously we provide you with the opportunity for questions. Um, just a quick overview, as, as you guys have, 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 many of you have seen before, St. Croix Operating was founded in 1996 by Mr. Melanchenko. Um, they have operations throughout the Midwest, including Colorado, Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming. I know some of those aren't in the Midwest. Those are some West. I'll get in trouble for that. Um, the Colorado operations are focused in Washington County, and they have several producing wells throughout Washington County. They operate with a focus on operating in a manner that protects public health, safety, and welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. Um, as you have heard, we have had a few permits before this commission, and they have always done their best to strive to develop their projects in the most environmentally friendly manner as possible. Um, further, is they're, they're actively engaged in, in Washington County community. Um, as, as I mentioned, they, they have a, a base of operations there and actively participate in trying to for, you know, better the community overall. So I want to turn over for the project interview, project overview and the rest of the presentation. I want to turn it over to Ms. Donahue with the Ardor Environmental. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners and Chairman Robbins. My name is Jessica Donahue. I am a permitting and compliance specialist with Ardor Environmental here representing St. Croix today. St. Croix has received a director's recommendation for the Dune OGDP before you. The Dune OGDP consists of 320 acres in the east half of section 28. Township 1 North, Range 50 West, and proposes to construct two oil and gas locations. For geographic referencing, the Dune project is approximately eight miles south of the nearest town, Otis, and approximately 47 miles southeast of Fort Morgan. The nearest crossroads are County Road 32 and County Road RR. The Dune project is located entirely within Washington County. While Washington County does not regulate oil and gas location siting, St. Croix does engage regularly with them on their projects, especially in items such as coordinating emergency response and truck haul routes. The Washington County local government designee is also involved in the review of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment Regulation 7 Pre-Production Air Monitoring Plan. The Dune OGDP is located in a rural area zoned for agricultural use. As mentioned earlier, the Dune OGDP consists of two oil and gas locations, the dune number one will be a producing location with one proposed vertical oil well. The dune production facility will not have any producing wells on the location. This location will only consist of production equipment for the dune number one and a proposed class two UIC dune SWD number two well. The dune number one producing well is proposed in the J-Sand while the dune SWD number two disposal well is proposed in the Lions Formation. This is not an enhanced recovery project. The census block that the Dune OGDP is located in has an overall Enviro screen score of 12.697. And as you can see from this image, there are no residential building units, school facilities, high occupancy building units, or designated outdoor activity areas within 2,000 feet. 
The project is 2017 feet from the nearest residential building unit. The RBU owners own several parcels in Washington County and have worked with St. Croix on numerous projects in the past. They are very well versed in St. Croix operations and are aware of the proposed Dune project. They have not expressed any concerns regarding Dune. The OGDP was initially submitted on November 4th, 2022 and received its completeness determination May 9th, 2023. The public comment period ended on June 18th of 2023 and there were no comments received. The deadline to file a petition for the OGDP was July 17th, 2023, and no petitions were received. The director's recommendation was issued on August 4th, 2023. The dune number one is proposed to be a vertical oil well location. It will be new disturbance of 5.28 acres. Once the well has been drilled and put onto production, the location will undergo interim reclamation because there's no production equipment proposed for the site the location will be brought down to a long-term disturbance of 0 0.01 acres. This location did not require an ALA. The Dune production facility will house production equipment for the Dune number one oil well. It will also be new disturbance and it will be 6.51 acres and it is adjacent to County Road 32. Once the Dune SWD number two has been drilled, the location will undergo interim reclamation and be brought down to a long-term disturbance of 1.886 acres. This location also did not require an ALA. And the dune production facility will only be constructed after dune number one has been drilled and determined to be a successful producing well. St. Croix operations are typically approximately one week to construct the location, one week to drill, and one week to prepare it for production. These wells are not hydraulically fractured. St. Croix anticipates commencing the Dune project this fall. St. Croix will construct the Dune number one location first and drill the Dune number one well. If the well is successful, then the Dune production facility will be constructed and they'll go about drilling the Dune SWD number two well. I would like to highlight a few of the best management practices St. Croix applies to their operations for you, such as protecting air quality, St. Croix will utilize off-location flow lines to consolidate all heavy traffic to the production facility that will be located adjacent to the county road. For minimizing their impacts on water resources, St. Croix utilizes recycled water for drilling and primarily just uses fresh water for dust mitigation. St. Croix was granted lesser impact exemptions for noise and light mitigation plans during their OGDP process for both dune locations. St. Croix uses efficient drilling methods to keep their drilling operations to an average of seven days. This minimizes the noise and cumulative impacts to the surrounding area. Lights will only be on location for drilling operations, which again is approximately about seven days. Lights will be downward directed and highlight the task areas as necessary for safety, and there will be no permanent lighting on location during production. By placing their production facilities adjacent to the county road, St. Croix minimizes truck traffic across the landscape and all fluids will be piped from the dune number one to the production facility. St. Croix will utilize closed loop drilling for this well and all drill cuttings are removed via covered trucks and disposed of at a commercial facility. St. Croix has designed the dune OGDP to protect public health, safety, welfare, and the environment by minimizing new disturbance utilizing off-location flow lines to minimize traffic and designing their drilling operations to use recycled water for drilling, as well as additional best management practices that were included in the mitigation plans that were submitted. And with that, I will turn it back to Mr. McGowan. So we just, we wanna emphasize, we appreciate the staff's uh, efforts and endeavors on this uh, particular project, as well as our operator. Um, we have worked diligently throughout this project to make sure we met all the standards um, required and answer uh, several of staff's questions. So we want to emphasize, we appreciate the commission's uh, assistance and staff's assistance on this project. And we would respectfully uh, move for approval um, from this commission on the Dune OGDP and associated spacing application. Great, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, we have an opportunity for commissioner questions. Are there questions from commissioners? Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation today. 
I, I was curious to know why we're separating the 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 well from the production facility and why those two are co-located. So I, I understand that the production facility is closer to the road, but you're disturbing two separate areas to do that. Is that facility a potential facility that another site could use or another well for, for anticipated expansion? Or I'm just wondering if you could flesh that out a little bit. Thank you for the question, Commissioner. At this time, the production facility will only support the Dune project. The way that St. Croix designs their locations is they prefer, and with their landowners, they prefer to keep the majority of the disturbance closer located to the county roads and not um, create that larger disturbance. As I mentioned with the Dune number one, once it undergoes the interim reclamation, it'll be brought down to a much smaller footprint. It's approximately 20 feet by 20 feet. And that way it's not disrupting as much of their agricultural operations. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Commissioner Messner? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation um, and the application. I did have a question around um, your gas capture plan. Um, I acknowledge that you do not anticipate um, natural gas to be associated with this well, but understanding that it's an exploratory well and the gas capture plan indicates that um, there'll be no gas gathering lines associated with this. Um, but rather if gas was encountered would be utilized beneficially on site. I think you've highlighted how that was gonna be utilized, um, but you've also indicated that should there be excess gas that you intend to combust that gas um, in a non-enclosed combustion device. I'm trying to better understand how you feel like that meets um, ECMC's rules regarding flaring and venting. Um, not for the beneficial utilization of it, but uh, in the combustion of it. Thank you for the question, Commissioner. St. Croix operations have shown that in the area, it's what's referred to as dead oil. So there has been no gas that St. Croix has found in any of their drilling operations. We, leave the caveat of in there would be just in case this is an anomaly and there would be gas. That's how we address it in the gas capture plan. But the if there is gas encountered, which 99% confident there won't be, if it is, it will be used on site. And the if there was additional gas that to be combusted, it would be in an enclosed combustor. So I guess my follow-up question there would be um, understanding that I, I believe that the rules require beneficial use uh, for any encountered natural gas associated with operations to be utilized um, on site and does not allow routine flaring um, associated with um, operations without an approved gas capture plan um, that if there was gas that was encountered that was more than would be able to be beneficially utilized on site, if you would be willing um, to agree to a, submitting a, a gas capture plan that makes a showing on how you will either increase the ability for beneficial use of that or develop an alternative method for dealing with any excess gas um, in a gas capture plan short of flaring. I would have to confirm with St. Croix, of course, but I don't see why that would be an issue if there is gas, if there should be gas encountered at this location that they would reevaluate the gas capture plan and be able to submit something to staff to describe in further detail how it would be utilized on site and how the equipment on site would be beneficial. 
benefit from the gas. But as throughout St. Croix drilling history in the area, there has been no gas found in the target formation. Yeah, I understand that and I appreciate that. Um, I need to make sure though that the gas capture plan as proposed appropriately addresses um, the rules that are required uh, by ECMC. And so I feel like a condition of approval associated with this um, that would uh, indicate what you just said, which was, uh, should there be a gas encountered on site in excess of what would be able to be beneficially utilized that uh, an updated gas capture plan be provided to ECMC staff that addresses how that will either be beneficially utilized um, uh, or um, removed from site in accordance with our rules. Commissioner, real quick, just to clarify, um, just so I make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. You're saying in the instance that this, the COA that you're proposing would be in the instance that we did encounter that gas, then we would submit, correct? Is that, is that what you're arguing? Correct. Your, your current gas capture plan indicates that should there be gas that is um, encountered that you would beneficially utilize it on site. And if there was excess gas beyond what was being able to be beneficially utilized on site, you would flare it. And I don't believe that that meets the requirements of our rules. And so what I'm requesting is a COA that would indicate that should gas be encountered, and it was in excess of what is being able to be beneficially utilized on site, that an updated gas capture plan is provided that shows how you will either increase how that gas would be beneficially utilized on site or other mechanisms for removing that gas away from site short of flaring. Mr. McGowan, do you need to consult with your client with regard to this proposal or can you, yeah, can you give us that? about two, yeah, can you give us about two minutes? Um, um if you wouldn't mind, let let me um consult with my client for about three minutes. I, I don't um the way the way he's framing it would be I, I don't think there would be objectionable, um, Commissioner Messner or Commissioner Robbins, but I do need to confer with my client if you would give me about three minutes. Well, before you take three minutes, let's see if there are any other questions that result in additional ideas relevant to this OGDP. Is there anybody else with questions? Comments, concerns, Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate Commissioner Commissioner Messner's exploration of that issue. I had it flagged as well. Uh, could you, Ms. Donahue, give a little bit more information on the communications with the nearest RBU landowner? I recognize that it is 2,017 feet from them, but it is still in significant proximity. Are they the uh, the landowner also of the uh, land where the facilities will be placed? And if not. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the communications with them and their responses? You mentioned in your statement that they don't have any issues with St. Croix. Uh, I think you intimated that you talked to them about this specific OGDP. And can you uh, give us a little bit more on the tenor of their feelings associated with this OGDP? Thanks. Thank you for the question, Commissioner. Um, I can speak briefly to it, and then we may need to bring Mr. Olds into the conversation. Um, as the land representative for St. Croix. But my understanding is that multiple parties of Saint, representing St. Croix have discussed the Dune project with the Shafferts. I wanna make sure that I spell their name or pronounce their name correctly. They do not own the surface where the production facilities are. They are an adjacent parcel. They have worked with St. Croix um, on other parcels that they did possess on different wells that St. Croix has pursued. And all of the communications that St. Croix representatives have had with them recently regarding the Dune project have been in support of the operation. Thanks for that comment. Uh, nothing further, Mr. Chair. Anything further from commissioners? All right, seeing none, um, I am in agreement with uh, Commissioner Messner's thought process as well. So. I believe if this is moving forward, it's likely that we would um, suggest that COA. So let's give Mr. McGowan uh, three minutes to speak with his client. Let's return at 1018. All right, uh, we are back on the record uh, in docket 2211-00309. Uh, Mr. McGowan, did you have a chance to speak with your client? I did, yes. And and thanks for the uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to break there and speak with them. 
Um, just a couple of things we want to clarify. I spoke with uh, both um, our, our, uh, the president of our art or environmental, uh, Ms. Fanning, and then I also spoke with my client. And a couple of things we just want to make sure. So we don't have any objection to that. It's actually, we believe it's contemplated in 903D3 that the, if in case, if in fact it were to exceed, um, if we were to find any gas, and, and my client has informed me that he is, uh, to Ms. To Ms. Donahue's point, about 99% sure there is no gas. But to your point, Commissioner Messner, in the case that that would exceed any beneficial use as contemplated in the rules, we would have, be happy to update that plan. And that that is a COA that we are perfectly acceptable with. Hey, A.G. Mercer, if you could uh, visualize yourself, do you want to uh, help us by sort of reframing what the COA should, you know, the actual language of the COA? Um, absolutely, Mr. Chair. And um, so my understanding is that the intent of the COA is to require that if St. Croix encounters um, gas at the location in excess of what can be beneficially used on site, um, that they will submit a revised gas capture plan um, that addresses how that gas will be used or otherwise uh, transported and not flared. Um, if it's the Commission's pleasure, I, it's often preferable in these situations to make sure that the intent of the COA is captured in, at hearing and then leave it to our technical staff to um, put the exact words on paper. Um, so that would be my suggestion unless um, the Commission would like exact words at this moment. I'm comfortable with that approach. Commissioner Messner, this was uh, your idea. Are you comfortable there as well? I am, Mr. Jim. Great. Uh, uh, Mr. McGowan, um, is that acceptable to your client, that, that, that approach? Yes, Mr. Chair, it sure is. All right. Uh, moving to deliberations um, and assuming there's no further questions, does anyone desire to initiate deliberations? Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm happy to... Uh to start uh, and also to make a motion. Um, I believe that the application does meet the rules and requirements associated with uh, ECMC. Uh, appreciate the applicant and staff working together on the particular application um, uh, with the addition of the condition of approval um, as discussed earlier, I would move approval of this application. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second uh, for approval of this docket with the referenced condition of approval. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, do we, uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. Um, we're going to now move to our next docket, uh, 2301-00035. Uh, my understanding is that there are a number of people that need to be elevated. Um, so why don't we take, an, uh, I mean, I think these short breaks make sense. Um, so let's, let's take 10 minutes. This will be our general normal break for the morning, and we'll return at 1020, 1032. You're muted, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Commissioner Messner. Uh, we're ready to get started. This is docket 2301-00035, an oil and gas development plan proposed by Kira McGee Oil and Gas Onshore. It is the subject of the flower OGDP. Um, before we get started, um, let's go ahead and take care of procedural matters. Uh, good morning, Ms. Waslinki. Could you elevate your witnesses and we'll get everybody sworn in? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. We've got everyone admitted to the Zoom, so if everyone could please turn their cameras on and we will do the swearing in. Quite a few subject matter experts here, so however you want to most efficiently do this. Uh, it's, it's however uh, A.G. Mercer desires to do this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so everyone um, on, on the panel, I'll just ask you uh, one at a time. I'll just go in the order that folks are on my computer screen. Um, and just ask you to raise your right hand, state your name, and say that you swear to tell the truth. Um, so let's start with Mr. Wells. My name is Matt Wells, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Ms. Madrid? 
I'm Stephanie Madrid and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Little. Yes, Andy Lytle, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Reimer. Joe Freeber, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, and apologies to everyone who I'm mispronouncing. <laughs> Mr. Johnson. Evan Johnson, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Green. My name is Edward Green, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Seastrom. My name's Ryan Seastrom, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Llewellyn. My name is Garrett Llewellyn, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Altenberg. Corey Altenberg, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Schlichtmeyer. Uh, Chad Schlichtmeyer, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Honus. Uh, Chris Honus, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Ms. Cray. Carissa Cray, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Justin Nelson, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Schwing. Oh, you're on mute. John Schwing, swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Um, is that, I believe that is everyone. If I've missed anyone, uh, please speak up. I believe Miss Julie Coleman. Julie Coleman, swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Is that everyone? Ms. Wozlinki, yes. do you, is that everybody? Yes. Yep, I'm confirming that is everybody. Thank you. That's so many witnesses. I've got two pages of Zoom panelists, so just making sure we got everybody. Okay, um, I've been informed by staff that uh, we should recognize Kara Weber first. Um, I believe she is in the panel. Hello. Yes, hi. Hi. I would like to read a statement. Good morning, Please. everybody. My name is Kira Weber, and I'm the lead OGLA in reviewing the flower OGDP. I would like to make one clarification. The director's recommendation states that produced water would be piped off location. However, the produced water will be transported from the location by a truck. Thank you. Okay, so we've had that uh, matter uh, corrected. Um, <clears throat> there is an opportunity for in the agenda for public comment, but I do not believe we have any public comment. Uh, and I'm not being correct. I'm not being corrected. So let's go with no public comment. Uh, next, we would have Jason Maxey, the director and local government designee for the Well County Oil and Gas Energy Department. Yes, uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, it's been a few weeks since I've been in front of you. So as always, I greatly appreciate the time that you allocate to either myself or one of my teammates to come before you and just talk in, in a brief summary about the Weld County process and our involvement uh, for the docket items uh, that you are considering. Um, just uh, one quick point on this. I'm sure that uh, the, the applicant will get into this in more detail, but the, the OGDP that is under this docket item um, has a couple different locations. Only one of those is in an incorporated Weld County. Um, the Schmergi location is the one that I'm going to be referencing in particular, uh, since that location went through the Weld County process, whereas the other location did not. So just to be clear about that. Um, we assigned case number 1041 WOGLA 23-0001 to this Schmergi location. Uh, we held our, our pre-op meeting for this uh, Schmergi location on August 17th of 2022. So right out a year ago now. Um, several alternatives were discussed through that process, which you all um, know how our, our pre-application meeting goes. Uh, attendees did include Kermagee staff, the city of Greeley, Larimer County, Weld County staff, CPW, and ECMC staff. The town of Windsor was also invited, but did not attend. Um, and I just 
do want to take just a second uh, to to do a quick shout out um, and kind of uh, uh, ring the bell again for the the, the Wealth County process, the pre-app process, and how well it works, um, and why we invite other jurisdictions to attend uh, outside of just the normal state jurisdictions, such as yourself and your staff involvement. Uh, by all means, the, the ECMC and the CPW involvement, um, not only is it laid out in our code, and it's very much appreciated to ensure a robust discussion at that critical, crucial planning stage of, of this process. But when we are looking around the entire development area, the involvement of other jurisdictions, uh, the potential involvement is, is critical as well. And I do just want to uh, publicly thank the city of Greeley and Larimer County for being a part of, of our pre-app discussion back last August. Uh, their input, and I'm sure, um, I'm sure Kerr McGee can, can uh, stress this as well, their input and their discussion uh, and their, their conversation during that pre-application phase uh, greatly uh, contributed to the permit that's in front of you all today and the permit that was in front of Well County for consideration also. So just a little bit of uh, off script uh, uh, pre-application, um, I guess, uh, elevation right there to, to just describe how much we appreciate it and the input really does matter when we're talking about the planning process. After we held the pre-application meeting in August, uh, Well County staff actually did receive a question from a, uh, a nearby property owner, Mr. Brad Inholson. Uh, that was at the end of October 2022. He had a question for us about setbacks, um, kind of how the location may affect potential new home construction on a parcel to the north of this proposed oil and gas location. Uh, we had a very good conversation with him. We addressed conversations regarding, uh, or questions, excuse me, regarding both not only oil and gas setbacks to residential structures uh, or to other receptors, but also if a permit was approved, what were the setbacks if somebody wanted to come in after the fact and build a, a residential uh, a structure? Um, and so we, we discussed those impacts and those associated setbacks. Uh, we also informed um, Kerr McGee of this discussion. Uh, we feel that Mr. Inholzen's con uh, concerns were addressed through that conversation that we had with him back in October. Uh, we did not hear from him after that. We didn't hear from him during the remainder of the notice period or during the 1041 Wogla hearing. Um, we did receive the application uh, for the Well County permit uh, in February of 2023. Um, during that time, I already mentioned Mr. Inholzen, but we did not receive any other public comments during our application period. We did also did not receive any requests to participate in our hearing, uh, not only from the public, but also from any other uh, referral entities that were um, given the chance to comment. We submitted uh, the 2A comments to the ECMC on June 9th of 2023, and those are included in the director's recommendation. We held our hearing on July 20th, uh, just a couple months ago, and uh, it was approved by the Well County Hearing Officer. The final order, as per our code, um, has been recorded with our clerk and recorder, and it was noticed in the Greeley Tribune July 28th of 2023. We do support appro approval of this permit, and we do agree with the director's recommendation, including the uh, slight correction that was made at the very beginning before my comments. Appreciate the time, as always. Thank you all, and I would be happy to entertain any questions if there are any from the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maxey. Uh, are there questions uh, for Mr. Maxey from the commission? All right, I'm not seeing any questions, as is always the case. I know how to reach you if something comes up later. Um, but I appreciate your being with us this morning, um, hearing from the relevant local government. Well, county in this instance is very important to our process, so we appreciate that. All right, uh, Ms. Wazalinki, I believe the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Maxey. Uh, we do have a PowerPoint, so give us just a moment. We'll get that pulled up, and I'll get started. Okay. Well, good morning again, commissioners. My name is Kelsey Wasilinki with Jost Energy Law. And with Jamie Jost, we represent Kerr McGee in the Flower OGDP before you today in docket 23010035. I'd like to thank Weld County and the City of Greeley for their participation through the WOGLA and USR processes and their support of this OGDP. And we'd also like to thank ECMC staff and the director for their efforts on this OGDP. Next slide. 
I'll take just a few minutes to summarize the FLOWER OGDP and requested relief before I turn it over to the Kermagee team. The FLOWER OGDP proposes two new oil and gas locations to develop a total of 24 horizontal wells in a two drilling and spacing units totaling 4,200 acres for the Niobrara, Fort Hayes, Codell, Carlisle, and Sharon Springs formations. The Schmergy pad is located in Weld County and as Mr. Maxey mentioned, the WOGLA was approved on July 20th, 2023. The Vista pad is located in the city of Greeley and the USR was approved on August 8th, 2023. The Flower OGDP also requests that the commission establish two drilling and spacing units, the Schmergy unit for 2,920 acres and 14 new horizontal wells and the Vista unit for 1,280 acres and 10 horizontal wells. The review of the Schmergy pad falls under the siting condition provided under Rule 604B3, as there is one residential building unit approximately 1,900 feet from the working pad surface for this proposed location. However, all wells, tanks, separation equipment, and compressors proposed on this oil and gas location will be located more than 2,000 feet from that residential building unit. And the review of the Vista pad is under Rule 604B4, as there are four residential building units within 2,000 feet of the working pad surface for this location, with the closest approximately 1,540 feet from the working pad surface. And Kermagee will walk through the 604B3 and four standards in the presentation today. This OGDP does not trigger any other Rule 304 ALA criteria, and specifically both locations are not within any high priority habitat. As part of the flower OGDP, Kermagee has committed to plugging and reclaiming 18 wells within one year of all new wells turning onto production and decommissioning six facilities. Kermagee will describe the associated emissions reductions in the presentation today. And finally, Kermagee has complied with all notice requirements for the flower OGDP, no formal petitions were filed, and no public comments were received on the Form 2As. And with that, I will turn it over to Ryan Seastrom, a Senior Regulatory Analyst with Kermagee, to continue the presentation. Wonderful. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wazelinki, for kicking off uh, the presentation for our proposed flower OGDP. Uh, good morning, Chair Robbins, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Ryan Seastrom, and I am a Senior Regulatory Analyst with Kermagee Oil & Gas Onshore LP. Uh, joining me today are my colleagues Matt Wells and Stephanie Madrid, who will be speaking later on. We uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to present our proposed OGDP today. I would also like to extend a thank you to Weld County and the ECMC staff for their involvement in this process. To kick our presentation off, uh, we will cover a variety of topics related to this OGDP, including BMPs, surface locations, siting considerations, and community outreach, among others. To provide a brief background about who we are, Kermagee Oil and Gas Onshore LP, or KMOG, is a subsidiary of Oxy USA Incorporated and is one of the largest producers of oil and natural gas here in the DJ Basin. Over the past five years, Kermagee has drilled over 1,400 new horizontal wells while safely plugging over 3,200 existing wells. Oxy brings over 50 years of carbon management experience to safely and securely store approximately 20 million metric tons of CO2 annually. In Colorado, they are currently working with academia and other industry partners to drill twin high temperature geothermal wells, as well as working on a carbon utilization and storage partnership grant with the Colorado School of Mines. We are excited to push further into the space while continuing to remain the operator of choice wherever we operate. Kermagee is proud to implement industry-leading BMPs with our development, including the utilization of our water on-demand system, which will eliminate approximately 183,836 truck trips, eliminating permanent and temporary oil storage tanks, and continuing to lead the industry with the lowest emissions inventory of any oil and gas operator here in the DJ Basin, while already meeting the 2030 CDPHE Reg 22 target. To begin the overview of our proposed locations, I'd like to start with the Schmergy 9-4 HC location. Kermagee did receive uh, approve, approval local disposition on a 1041 WOGA permit on July 20th, 2023. 
The proximate local governments are the city of Greeley and the town of Windsor, and Kermagee received no objections from either. There is one residential building unit located 1,907 feet to the north of the location. And as already mentioned, this location is outside of high priority habitat designated outdoor activity areas, and there are no schools or child care centers nearby. It is also not within a floodplain or immediately upgradient from wetlands or riparian areas. It is also not located in a disproportionately impacted community. This pad's location on the parcel was determined after working with the surface owner, and while there is one RBU within 2,000 feet, this location meets the criteria for Rule 604B3 that all wells, tanks, separation equipment, or compressors are located more than 2,000 feet from all RBUs. For our proposed VISTA 13-16HZ location, we have received local disposition via an approved use by special review permit from the City of Greeley on August 8, 2023. The proximate local government is Weld County, which we received no objections from. There are four RBUs within 2,000 feet of the working pad surface, with the closest being 1,542 feet to the southwest. This location is also outside of high priority habitat, designated outdoor activity areas, and not near any schools or child care centers, and is not located within a floodplain or immediately upgraded from wetlands or riparian areas. It is not in a disproportionately impacted community either. To provide a brief uh, Overview of our permitting timeline. Uh, no comments were received during the 30 day comment period, and no petitions were filed prior to the OGDP petition deadline. Kermagee has also received a director's, a favorable director's recommendation on July 27th, 2023. Since our two proposed locations are near RBUs, I'd like to provide an overview of Rule 604B4 and how Kermagee plans to avoid minimize and mitigate any potential impacts that may affect the surrounding receptors. As stated in the statement of basis and purpose, the commission's intent is to reflect the distance is only one way to protect public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife. Kermagee plans to show through this presentation how we achieve the required protections through considerations of facility design, best management practices, controlled technologies, and others. To begin with substantial equivalence, the Commission will base its findings on information including, but not limited to, BMPs, technology, local government disposition, facility design, and community engagement. These next two slides, I'll be reviewing how Kermagee plans to avoid, minimize, and mitigate, and mitigate excuse me, potential impacts. To avoid odor, Kermagee plans to use Group 3 drilling mud and closed loop completions operations. To avoid traffic, we will utilize our water on demand system, as well as implement an oil tankless facility, eliminating approximately 270,188 truck trips between the two locations. Minimizing measures include plugging and abandoning 18 older wells and eliminating six facilities, reducing visual fragmentation by 15.3 acres. Mitigating measures include speed restrictions, neutral colored facilities, and a solid steel wall will be placed on the VISTA location in the direction of the RBU to help mitigate any visual impacts. Further avoidance measures include the use of electric powered production equipment and air actuated pneumatic devices to reduce emissions. Minimizing measures include real-time facility monitoring by our Integrated Operations Center, or IOC, further reducing truck, tra truck traffic, the use of Tier 4 dual fuel completions engines, and the use of a natural gas drilling rig with a battery energy storage system. The Shmurgi location will have 500 linear feet of 32-foot sound walls, and the Vista location will have 800 linear feet of sound walls to help mitigate any potential noise impacts. Under Rule 604B4A, the Commission will consider the Director's recommendation on an oil and gas development plan. As mentioned earlier, Kermagee is grateful to receive the Director's recommendation for approval for our Flower OGDP and its associated locations on July 27, 2023. We are confident our proposed locations will protect the public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. To continue the 604B4 discussion, I'd like to touch on geology, technology, and topography. Specifically, geology, physical characteristics, and technologies 
used may affect the extent and severity of potential impacts. To begin with geology, Kermagee will be drilling east to west through a structurally quiet region through typical polygonal style faulting. We plan to reach step outs of up to 4,800 feet while also drilling up to four mile lateral wells. I'd also like to highlight some of the technology that Kermagee will be using to reduce potential impacts from our development. As I previously mentioned, we'll be using a natural gas drilling rig with our battery energy storage system for drilling, which will help cut down on emissions. Kermagee will utilize a quiet completions fleet using dual fuel tier four engines, and our facilities are designed using a closed loop system and will be oil tankless along with remote monitoring capabilities through our 24 hour manned integrated operations center. Topography is also taken into consideration when citing our proposed locations, considering the need for stormwater management and how potential nearby receptors could be impacted. Here you can see two different views from each of our proposed locations. Along with topography, the location of receptors and proximity to them is taken into consideration as distance to human and wildlife receptors can also affect the extent and severity of potential impacts. On this slide, we have a map, a map of each proposed location and distance to RBUs within 2,000 feet. Schmergi has one RBU located 1,907 feet to the north, while Vista has four RBUs, three to the west and one to the southwest of the proposed location, which is 1,542 feet from the working pad surface. While there are RBUs, I'd like to reiterate that these locations are outside of high priority habitat not located in disproportionately impacted communities and not near any designated outdoor activity areas, child care centers, or schools. Kermagee also takes into account the timing and phases of our development as they may affect the extent or severity of potential impacts. Currently, Kermagee plans to begin pad construction on both of these locations in the fourth quarter of this year, 2023, and will enter into the interim reclamation phase in the first and second quarter of 2025, respectively. These locations will both be less than five acres after interim reclamation, with the Schmergi location being 4.37 acres and the Vista, lo uh, apologies, the 7.31 7 acres uh, and the Vista location being 3.81 acres. Improved technological capabilities will result in reduced time on location for drilling and completions, while drilling the Schmergi wells both east and west eliminates the need for a second well pad, further reducing any potential impacts. Kermagee is coordinated with local governments to receive a favorable local disposition on both of these proposed locations, and we appreciate the Commission's consideration of these local land use decisions and permit terms consistent with Rule 604B4C. As mentioned prior, Kermagee received an approved 10, 1041 WOGA permit from Weld County on July 20th, 2023, and received an approved use by special review permit from the city of Greeley on August 8th, 2023. Uh, to continue the 604B4 uh, discussion, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Matt Wells who will discuss the alternative location analysis for both of these locations within our FLOWER OGDP. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, and good morning, commissioners. Great to see you all again. We have a lot to cover, so I'll just jump right into it. This slide here reminds us what the rule language and the statement of basis and purpose are for 604B4D alternative location analysis. This slide shows the density of residential building units around the mineral development area and the surface locations that Kermagee assessed. The red shaded areas show the 500, 1,000, and 2,000 foot buffer areas around each residential building unit. We have color coded the preferred location and the alternative locations, and I will zoom in on each DSU on the coming slides. I will now walk you through the alternate locations for the Schmergi application. The alternative number one site avoids RBUs and, like our preferred location, avoids any criteria from Rule 304B2B. However, 
drilling from this location is not technically feasible and would exceed the capabilities of the drilling rigs that we contract here in the DJ Basin. This would either ultimately strand minerals and or force us to have a second pad location for this DSU. Alternative number two in section five is in the middle of crops and Kermagee attempts to avoid impacting agricultural lands. Furthermore, this surface owner is not interested in having oil and gas activities on their property. All, the last alternative, number three in section three, would be closer to high priority habitat and the topography of this area would make it very challenging to build a pad with adequate grading and stormwater BMPs. Also, Kermagee could not secure a surface use agreement with this surface owner. The preferred Schmergy location will allow for maximum mineral recovery from one pad with the least number of impacts to surrounding receptors. Mr. Wells, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It looks like we're inadvertently sharing an older version of our hearing presentation. So before we get too much further down the line, could you give us one minute to get our um, the e-filed hearing presentation up for you? Thank you. Apologize for the interruption. Let's go to slide 29, please. Thank you. Looks so much better. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the time to adjust that. Let me continue. I will now walk you through the alternative locations for the Avista application and the other surrounding area options to this DSU. The three alternative sites were reviewed on the east side of section 17. All three would be closer to the Indian Head subdivision to the west, and sites one and two would impact some prime agricultural land. Kermagee did have conversations with this surface owner, and they were not interested in having oil and gas activities on their property, making these alternative sites unusable. Alternative number four on the eastern side of the DSU in that southwest quarter section of 14 was also looked at. This alternative would be within 500 feet of a potential wetlands, and the surface owner was not interested in having oil and gas activity on their property. This eliminates all of that southwest corner of section 14 as a possibility. The northwest quarter of section 14 is occupied by the High Point Business Park and is not an option. The preferred location for the proposed Vista pad in the southwest quarter of section 16 is really the only spot in all of section 16 and all of section 15 that is zoned for oil and gas and the long range planning of the Apex Vista Del Antero planned unit development within the city of Greeley. They specifically chose this spot for oil and gas and the development plan because it is compatible with the surrounding current usage and the planned long-term usage of that area. Now, the remaining open looking areas near the Vista DSU are in section 21 and 22 to the south and section nine and 10 to the north. And I'll explain why each are not viable options. A pad in the north or northeast section of 21 would require very large step outs and would be very difficult to drill. Furthermore, the service owner is just not interested in having oil and gas on our property. Section 22 already has oil and gas activity on it, and the surface owner is not interested in having any additional wells that access areas where they do not have a mineral interest. For section 9 and 10 on the north side of the DSU, we have the same situation as section 21, where it just require very large step outs to access minerals, specifically on the south side of the planned DSU, and would be technically infeasible to reach. On top of that, the city of Greeley has very specific long-term planning criteria for this area, and it's right along Highway 34 entering their city limits. This is their welcome to Greeley area, and they prefer not to have oil and gas developed there. I hope this explains some of the rationale of the preferred Vista location versus the alternatives and some of the open looking areas. Uh, we'll be glad to answer any questions about the ALA at the end of this presentation. In addition to human receptors, it was very important for Kermigee to consider the impacts to wildlife of our proposed development. Here's the applicable rule language around high priority habitats. This map with the high priority habitat and floodplain layers turned on shows that neither the approach Mergi or Vista pads are located in any areas of concern. Following slides address how Kermagee's infrastructure and siting of oil and gas location will be provide a net benefit to the area from the perspective of cumulative impacts, 
number of operating facilities, and surface disturbance areas. Kermagee's infrastructure minimizes impacts and increases consolidation. The oil tankless facility design eliminates over 85,000 post-production truck trips, and the water on demand pipeline system will eliminate over 183,000 of the pre-production truck traffic. For cumulative impacts, Kermagee commits to reclaiming a total of 15.3 acres by plugging 18 older wells and removing those six associated facilities as a part of this application. After interim reclamation, Kermagee will have reclaimed 7.1 more acres than the project has disturbed, a net positive in the surface disturbance and number of oil and gas facilities in this area. Here is a map of those 18 older wells that Kermagee will plug within one year after the new flower OGDP wells are turned on to production. The emissions reductions by removing those wells and facilities are highlighted in the green table. And you can see the combined reduction for both those sites right below that. The following slides address how Kermagee's infrastructure and best management practices are designed to avoid, then minimize, then mitigate impacts to all receptors when developing new oil and gas production sites. Kermagee's facilities are designed to avoid impacts as much as possible. And I think this graph really demonstrates how the changes Kermagee made with the facility design have allowed us to increase overall production while dramatically avoiding tank VOCs. You couple that with air actuated devices, group three drilling muds, has really allowed Kermagee to avoid numerous impacts. When impacts can't be avoided, Kermagee strives to minimize them as much as possible. And for this OGDP specifically, I would like to share a few of the minimization efforts. To reduce emissions, Kermagee will use a closed loop system and compressed natural gas rig engines. Sites will be outfitted with temporary emission combustion devices and on the permanent water storage tanks equipped with combustion devices with a 98% or greater destruction efficiency. To reduce noise, Kermagee will use a drilling rig with a sound reduction upgrade and quiet completion suite. And last, to reduce visual impacts, 18 older wells and six facilities will be decommissioned to help reduce visual fragmentation of the area. Kermagee will also mitigate impacts whenever reduction is not an option. We've put together a customized mitigation plan specifically for this flower OGDP, considering the receptors in the area. For emissions mitigation, AVO inspections and infrared inspections will be conducted to inspect for gas leaks. To mitigate sound impacts, all of these pads will have walls strategically located to mitigate noise from pre-production operations while also committing to continuous sound monitoring. To mitigate impact from lights, Kermagee commits to angling lights away from surrounding RBUs and utilizing LED lights to reduce sky glow. The aerial map on this slide shows the haul routes that have been designed to efficiently route traffic to paved arterial roads. These routes have been approved by both local governments. Now, these pads were also scoped for produce water takeaway, and unfortunately was not feasible for this project. A new 15 mile long pipeline would need to be built to the nearest SWD, and that would unfortunately create an additional 97 acres of disturbance. Kermagee consulted with the CDPHE regarding this application. This slide shows the timeline of that consultation. Kermagee commits to 40 best management practices relating to air, water, waste, and PFAS based on that consultation. Kermagee has also been making progress on emissions avoidance during high ozone action days and commits to all the ozone action day BMPs when feasible. The graph on the right hand shows the efforts that Kermagee has been partaking in that have eliminated over 74 tons of VOCs during 2022's ozone action days. Kermagee employees are often encouraged to work from home and avoid commuting traffic, commuting to the office during those ozone action days. Next, I'd like to provide an overview of our robust air monitoring program. The air monitoring plan for this OGP will be submitted to the CDPHE in Q4 of 2023. Air monitoring summaries for these locations will be posted to the Oxy stakeholder website monthly for anyone to review. Since 2020, we have monitored at 19 different drilling sites 
27 different completion sites and 15 different production facility sites, giving us thousands of data points to evaluate for any potential impacts from our operation. The map on the right shows how Kermagee will position those air monitoring sensors around the Schmergy location, for an example. Over the past three years, using the approved air monitoring program, Kermagee has collected nearly 7,000 air samples spanning all phases of oil and gas development. And all those results, as shown on this graph on the left, are well below CDPHE's health guidance value of nine parts per billion for benzene. The nearest RBU on both pads will have two air monitors placed directly between them and the working pad surface, one at 165 feet away and the other at 300 feet away from the pad. If these monitors were to detect any VOCs or benzene, Kermagee's IOC will be alerted and our team will jump into immediate action to resolve the situation. I'm now going to hand off the presentation to our stakeholder relation advisor, Stephanie Mitre, to tell you about our community outreach plan. Thank you. Um, as Matt said, I will be covering rule 604B4G, community outreach. First, we'll look at the Schmerby location. Here you'll see on the map that there is that one RVU to the north, um, just shy of 2,000 feet at 1,907 feet. Um, for Schmerby, we've had two in-person meetings, eight phone calls or voicemails, 23 emails or text message conversations, as well as um, printed and mailed materials and hand-delivered materials. This is a general timeline of our engagement. For the Schmervy location, we started our communication with the stakeholders nearby in September of last year. Um, those conversations start as they generally do, introducing our team, understanding feedback of um, oil and gas development, answering any questions, and then getting further through the process of sharing what the proposed project is and what the the proposed process looks like and the next steps in the regulatory process. This is sort of a snapshot of how we capture interactions with um, stakeholders in the area. There are three sections here, um, but you'll notice just the top one is the one that has the RBU. Um, we had, like I said, meetings on location and talked about several different things. One point of focus that was of interest to the stakeholder was grading in which we did have um, brief conversations about that and then handed him off to another subject matter expert to have another uh, meeting about that so they could speak in terms that I was not able to address. Next slide, please. Here we'll look at the Vista location. Um, this map shows the two different stakeholder families that we interacted with near Vista. Um, many multiple in-person meetings took place. We've had um, over 30 phone calls. We, with in partnership with the town of Greeley, put on a, a virtual community meeting in which nobody attended for the Vista location. Um, so over eight months of communication with these nearby stakeholders. Here is the general engagement timeline for VISTA. Um, many months, similar to Schmervy, we started engagement in October, October um, introducing ourselves and um, our team, and then all the way continuing until um, this timeline only goes to July, we're continuing conversations now with the nearby stakeholders. Again, snapshot of our activities that we've had with the two families near the proposed Vista location. Um, the nearest RBU is in general support. Um, although we did schedule a meeting to, to meet in person on location, um, they didn't show up for that meeting. Um, something else came up, but have had several conversations and there remain no outstanding concerns. Um, the stakeholder family to the West, um, many in-person on location meetings. Um, and while there still continues to be some general frustration about growth in the area and um, mainly traffic as that relates to that growth, 
um, and we continue to work on other options um, for additional permanent visual mitigation to potentially help shield some of the concerns of the traffic. Um, there remain continued conversations with this stakeholder. Um, yeah, that's my last one on that one. All right, thank you, Ms. Madrid. Oh, I'm sorry, it's you, I'm sorry. And now Kelsey. No, no problem. Thank you. Um, I'll just briefly re review the requested drilling and spacing units before concluding the presentation. The proposed Schmergy drilling and spacing unit is for 2,920 acres and 14 new horizontal wells. Kermagee submitted Rule 505 land, regulatory, geology, and engineering testimony in support of the OGDP and the Schmergy spacing application, including the requested subsurface setbacks. Next slide. The proposed VISTA drilling and spacing unit is for 1,280 acres and 10 new horizontal wells. And again, Kermagee submitted Rule 505 land, regulatory, geology, and engineering testimony in support of the OGDP and the VISTA spacing application, including the requested subsurface setbacks. Next slide. So to summarize the flower OGDP, I note the following highlights. No petitions or public comments were received. Both locations have approved relevant local government siting permits. Kermagee proposes the Schmergy location under the siting condition provided in Rule 604B3 by locate, locating all wells, tanks, separation equipment, and compressors more than 2,000 feet from the residential building unit. Kermagee's best management practices, commitments, and facility design on both the Schmergy and the Vista pads provide substantially equivalent protection of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources pursuant to Rule 604B4. And finally, Kermagee's commitment to plugging and abandoning 18 wells and six facilities result in a total of 15.3 acres reclaimed, which is 7.1 more acres than the project ultimately disturbs. Um, and the corresponding emission reductions are reiterated on this slide. Next slide. This slide just shows the relief requested for the flower OGDP. This does conclude our presentation. Um, as you can see, Kermagee has a number of subject matter experts on the hearing today. So I'll have everyone please turn on your cameras. We can, I think, take the PowerPoint down and we are now open for questions. Great. <clears throat> just an initial question. Uh, staff had clarified um, that there, water was going to be trucked away but then i noticed here there was the water on demand system can you and maybe i should know this but can you clarify that point yes Absolutely. certainly thank you chair robbins um so yes for uh produced water will be trucked away from location however for completions activities uh, that does utilize our water on demand system um so they will be separate and why is the produced water being trucked? So the produced water will be trucked uh, due to the uh, disturbance and uh, difficulty of uh, installing a produced water takeaway pipeline to the nearest disposal facility. What would, just so the record is clear, what would that look like? Yeah, um, certainly. Matt, would you mind uh, reiterating um, the points you made on the slide? Yes, yes, Commissioner. So we scoped a produced water take line pipeline, and it would take 15 miles of pipeline to get to the nearest SWD. And the uh, disturbance of that pipeline would be about 97 acres. And uh, really, that outweighs the impacts of the trucking of water, specifically with the you know trucking of the water um, heaviest during that first year of production, and then tapers off quickly after that. So we just felt that outweighed the impacts of trucking if, if we were to move forward with a 15 mile long pipeline for produced water. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Um, I know my fellow commissioners have probably questions, so I'm looking at them. You might need to raise your hand. Uh, Mike, uh, Commissioner Cross, thanks. There's a whole lot of people on the screen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, admittedly, I was going to have some of the questions on the produced water takeaway too. Um, in the slide, you talked about the 97 acres, Mr. Wells, and, and I was curious what the what the pathway would look like to that, and if that had any impact on the decision. Is it also following some of these county roads, 
or what would the pathway look like for that produced water takeaway? Yes, it would be a challenging pathway. The nearest disposal, um, uh, available disposal, one that you know has the capacity, um, is south on County Road 19 and County Road 26. Uh, so it would require you know lots of right-of-way crossings, lots of County Road uh, crossings, um, and be you know pretty difficult to to get to. Now I don't have the exact route that was scoped. We can get that for you if you'd like, um, but just know it, it would not be an easy pipeline, and it would. Require a lot of disturbance and a lot of work, and, and and no need at all for the for the exact location. I was just kind of curious if it went to, especially for the vistas, as you started looking towards some of the RBUs to the south and west, if it was going to be near that, or if it was kind of going away to more of the agricultural land. Gotcha. Uh, generally, the direction of that pipeline would go south, the south then southeast. Okay. Um, thank you for that, and. And I wanted to touch on a, a couple other things that were talked about late about the air monitoring that was also, especially as it kind of related to, again, the Vista um, in that Southwest area. I know a couple of the air monitoring proposed sites that were mentioned um, were on either side of the highway there um, to get closer to where the, the closest RVUs are. What kind of steps you take to to adjust for um, the ongoing traffic on the highways to to try and compare what's going on with that air monitor yeah i'll try to end well i would love to hand this off to our subject matter expert x is a chess list minor he is uh, uh one of our experts on our air monitoring program and i'd like to highlight him and answer your question commissioner Cross. yeah chess look um the figure we showed in the presentation is potential air monitoring location um, we have not submitted a plan to cdphe so those will be reviewed but typically we when we start looking at locations we look at where the use are um you know roads are taken in consideration but typically we don't see a lot of impact on the monitors from traffic i mean if it was an area where there's maybe some people that were stopping there idling and things like that we might take that in further considera consideration but just going down a road um, I would expect minimal impact. I appreciate that. Um, and I want to touch on a couple of things that were discussed, especially in, with respect to the alternative location analysis. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was that you will be having approximately 4,800 foot step outs and then four mile laterals. Um, Looking at the maps, I'm guessing the 4,800 foot step outs is for the Vista, but not for the, the Schmurgy location. Is that correct? For sure, I'd love to highlight Chris Honus, our drilling manager, to really get into the details of that. So, Chris, if you can answer the question, that'd be great. Great. Appreciate but, it. Uh, the Schmurgy pad, the hey, exact step out. I'm sorry. Was... Let me interrupt. Um, actually, no, we're good. I was making sure we had everybody sworn in, but we did that at the beginning. Go ahead now. Mr. Honest. You bet. No problem. Uh, so the Smurgy pad, we have really, really long laterals planned on that pad. There'll be record lateral lengths uh, for what Oxy's ever drilled in the past. Um, we tried to find a pad location that kept the step out distances minimal. So we weren't trying to do very long step outs in combination with very, very long lateral lengths. I apologize that I don't know the exact step out distance for that alternative location. But off the top of my head, not looking at the PowerPoint, I think it was about three quarters of a section uh, for that northernmost well from that southern alternative location. Doing that plus a re record lateral length, it seemed like you were combining, pushing the limit on what's ever been done with also pushing the limit on the step out distance as well. And it just didn't feel like a good move to sort of, what's a good word for it, jump off a cliff and, and try everything all at once. Perfect, and I appreciate it. And, that, and that's kind of exactly what I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't looking at the very long step outs in addition to four mile laterals, which right. I don't I don't think we've seen four miles. I know we've seen some three and even some three and a quarter, but um, so I just wanted to, to confirm that's what that was, um, especially as I know that as you looked at some of the, some of the alternative locations were described and, and how they, those were, analyzed i know a couple of them i know the vista for sure and i'm just trying to pull up the the actual slide here the vista for sure some are looked at below as well as 
the Schmurgi somewhere looked at below um, and, and just trying to confirm that that will the step out there when combined with the lateral is just is just operationally infeasible at this point right the the vista pad if we were to go to that southern location uh it would be it would be very long step outs to keep the laterals going east west those would be getting to that technical unfeasible type state if you were to try to do like short laterals going north and south you would have to double the well count for the area and that also felt like um, not what you'd want to do it take longer to drill and you'd have a lot more surface impact by doing that so the location that was chosen kept reasonable step outs uh, for long laterals which kept the total well count at a minimum um and then one thing that i wanted to and this is probably for mr seastrom one thing i wanted to confirm um I just wanted to make sure that I understood what was going to be used for drilling and for completions, because I thought I heard you say one thing, and then it showed something different in the presentation, and, and I just wanted to confirm that. So I, I thought that I heard you say dual fuel for the drilling rig, um, and then natural gas for the completion but it looked different in that. And so I, I just wanted to clarify what was being used there because I also saw that you are using the battery for the for the drilling rig, is that correct? Certainly, Commissioner Cross. Uh, yes, that is correct. So for the drilling rig, uh, it is a natural gas drilling rig with our battery energy. Uh, we are utilizing a uh, tier four engine uh, dual fuel completions equipment. And then I think I think that's the only questions I have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Fisher. You're muted, Mr. Chair. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks for all the information today. I, I was wondering, um, can you remind me for both locations, are we dealing with the same surface use owner, the surface owner, or are these two different surface owners? Mr. Seastrom? Oh, thank you, Commissioner Regan. I apologize. I'm having some issues with my Zoom um, muting and unmuting. So I thank you for bearing with me. Um, they are uh, when I able to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. If you're talking, we can't hear you now. Why don't we have Mr. Wells yeah. answer that question? I'll, if that's... I'll jump in. It's two different surface owners um, for the one for the Vista and one for the Schmurgi. If that was what your question was, Commissioner. Yes, thank you. So I'm wondering if you could um, maybe page 29 on your presentation is a good kind of map of the area. If you could show me where the surface owner lives. I, I, does the surface owner live near either, either of these locations? It, I'm just, for my own edification, wondering where the surface owner lives and if it's if they're gotcha. impacted as well by this development. Gotcha, you know, and I'd really love to bring on our surface land negotiator, Evan Johnson, to talk to you about that. Evan, please. <clears throat> yes, good morning, commissioners. Uh, both of the surface owners do not live on location. Um, Mr. Schmurgi lives further to the west, quite far away, uh, and the surface owner for uh, the Vista pad does not live on location as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could also give us an idea of, in relationship to where these new wells are going to be exist, where the 18 wells and the six facilities will be reclaimed? Are they in the same general area? I can handle that question for you. And actually, if we would jump to slide 35, please, uh, we'll have a map to show you where exactly those are. So you can see on the top map, the Schmurgi proposed working pad service location off to the right there. And then the red dots are the wells that'll be um, p and And the facilities are really close to those red dots as well. And same thing okay. with this the down below. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry, I saw that. I didn't didn't quite register for me. Thank you. No um, thanks. I don't. That's great. Good for the maps. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about um, 
what the emissions profiles look like between an electric drill rig, a tier four engine, and your proposed natural gas with battery assist? Like, are we in the same area? Is it, can you just talk about that a little bit? Sure, no problem. I would love to highlight Carissa Cray, our air quality manager, and she can get into the nuts and bolts about that question. Sure, yeah, just just to clarify the emission profile, are you talking just drilling, right? Yes, let's, yes. Okay, Thank okay. So, yeah, so there's a few different tiers that you could use for drill rigs. What we're proposing is the battery and natural gas option, which other than going electric is your lowest emitting option for drill rigs. If you step it up from there, um, the combination of a natural gas and diesel would be your next highest emitting option for drill rigs. And then the standard rig is a tier two diesel engine. That would be your highest emitting option. Okay. And there's significant reductions each of those steps down. That you see. So what I'm hearing you say is this is the next best thing you can do, but for electrification. Correct. And that we are just, aware of for the technology. Okay. Could you describe uh, your efforts to look into using electric drill rigs as a starting point? Yeah, I'll pass that one over to Chris Honus. You bet. Um, in the area, uh, we're still working with the electric companies trying to figure out if electricity would be available on these pads. Usually we submit uh, to them. Uh, it takes a little while to turn around and find out if the grid can handle it. Our strategy is to use the natural gas drilling rigs with the battery anytime the electric company comes back and says the grid can't handle it and would take substantial upgrades to get the grid there. Uh, when electric does become available, we do like to use electric. Uh, so in this particular case, we're ensuring that for sure we'll be able to do natural gas. And if it ends up falling into place that the electric company can supply the power needs, uh, then we go ahead and use electric as it is a little bit small step change better in, in the emissions. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could also talk a little bit about um, what reduced emissions look like uh, by electrifying both of the sites after you after you're in production, if I'm understanding correctly, right? That's what we're agreeing to. That is correct. Uh, the production facilities will be electrified, um, and then I will turn it over to Carissa Cry again. Yeah. So when you have electricity at your facilities, you're able to reduce um, for our current design. We don't use any. Is anyone else in the bubble or is it just me? Yeah, I think it's everybody. Ms. Cray, you may want to turn your video off. Let's try it that way. And then start sure. over with your answer, Ms. Cray. Yeah, is that any better? It's yeah. a whole lot better. Yes. Okay. So for electrification of facilities, um, we don't currently use any vapor recovery units or compressors at these facilities, but if you did need them, say you had a reason you would need like a gas lift compressor or something, for example, you would be able to use an electrified engine. So you would eliminate all of those NOx emissions associated with engines at a facility. That is a big driver for electrification at facilities. Um, it also allows us to run our instrument air compressors. So pneumatic controllers run off of instrument air with no generators or anything having to produce that electricity. To do that, um, lacked units are able to be installed and used for our oil gathering. So those are kind of the big emission reductions associated with electrification. Thank you. I, um, I am wondering if you all contemplated having the produced water tanks all at the, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Schmiggy location, so that you could reduce truck traffic for the folks near the Vista, because the traffic seems to be a concern to them, and you potentially then are only picking up from one location. Go ahead and answer that question. Oh, sorry, Matt, go ahead. Thank you, Ryan. So if I understand your question correctly was, did we consider having all the produced water 
go to one facility in the area, the Schmergy facility, and then just truck it all from that location. Is that the is that the question? Yes, sir. Okay. I don't think that exact plan was scoped. Um, we always keep an open mind about could there be a centralized spot somewhere in the area to 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 send produce water and truck. Um, this one was a little bit difficult with you know Highway 34, Highway 257. Um, it just did not make sense for this project. Uh, so I don't think uh, we scoped it specifically for Schmerby, no. Okay. And then um, I'm wondering if you could remind me when you're planning on drilling. So related to trying to avoid high ozone season, I can't remember when you guys said you were anticipating drilling. I apologize. Certainly. Uh, can we please go to slide 22? Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, Commissioner, here's the outline of our schedule. Uh, currently, we're proposing uh, drilling uh, to occur in the first quarter of 2024, February. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your answers. Commissioner, Mes Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you all for the presentation and the information that was provided. Um, I do appreciate the organization of the application and the level of information that was provided. <clears throat> I am missing some information though, and so I'm gonna ask a couple of questions around some local government disposition, um, particularly the, the uh, city of Greeley, as I understand that that land use process um, occurred recently, and at least it wasn't in the information that I was provided any particular disposition associated with that um, land use decision. And my specific questions around that is if there could be additional detail uh, provided around um, what ultimately was a special use, which I think can have a lot of different conditions of approval um, and a lot of different elements to it that potentially um, affect operations and or uh, could be important information for this commission to understand. And so if someone could talk a little bit about any conditions of approval or specific things that were done in the use by special right review associated with the city of Greeley and anticipated land uses um, around the particular locations that uh, I'm sure were part of the use by uh, special right review in city of Greeley's land use process. I'll take that question, Commissioner. Yes, uh, we did the use by special review process with the city of Greeley. It was an iterative process that had its own pre-application meeting um, and multiple rounds of application submission and um, back and forth question answering with the city. Um, we ultimately got to a place where we um, received unanimous approval at their planning and zoning commission hearing. And uh, that is as far as it goes with their process. It does not go to second stage or to the city council, unlike some other local uh, government jurisdictions. Uh, as far as I'm aware and can remember, no conditions of approval were um, placed on the VISTA USR approval. And overall, it was uh, a good, good, good experience. And the city of Greeley was satisfied with uh, all the BMPs that we had in place and uh, our application as a whole. So to get a little more specific, was there discussion during that process about anticipated land uses, um, uh, you know, around the particular location um, by the city of Greeley and, um, you know, understanding that I'm sure in the process you proposed a set of BMPs, where those were unanimously accepted with no additional BMPs associated or additional information needed to be provided at any stage of this process uh, up until the final decision? Yeah, I, I can tell you about the discussions we had at length with the city of Greeley and the Apex Vista um, Corporation surface owners and their planned unit development of that area. You know, we worked closely with that developer and the city to make sure that the Vista pad was compatible uh, with the current usage of that land and the long-term planning of that land. Uh, like section 16 and 15 of that Vista, it's a planned use development, a mixed use planned use development with um, you know, detention ponds and ponds and parks and buffer space, natural wildlife buffer space uh, around our proposed Vista pad. Uh, so a lot of conversation went about around that. 
Uh, and yes, they were satisfied with our BMPs uh, related to traffic and related to um, all of our mitigation efforts. So um, to specifically speak more to that, I'd have to get back to you on that as the analyst who had a lot of those conversation isn't present today. Commissioner, we can also turn it over to our uh, land negotiator, Evan Johnson, uh, to provide further detail in uh, discussions that were had between his team, uh, the landowner, and the city. Thank you. I'd, yeah, actually, thank you. I'd appreciate that. And if, you know, some other some other detail that is helpful to me. And, and, and I apologize, I'm asking this at hearing. I mean, typically that information is provided to us and I'm able to read those dispositions, you know, as part of my preparation, but I didn't have that as part of this. And so in order for me to fully review the 604B for substantial equivalency requirements, I need to understand uh, local government dispositions. Uh, and so that's why I'm asking these questions. Um, and so one other piece is any kind of public interaction or public feedback that was provided during any of the planning commission meetings associated with the use by special right review. Yeah, good morning, commissioners. As it relates to the Del Intero PUD in the city of Greeley, um, they will start their development east in section 15 and then progress systematically westerly uh, towards the Vista location. Um, as far as an actual timeline goes, based on our drilling and completions, we will be long done before any sort of planned development is within 2,000 feet of our operations based on their timeline. And does anyone know whether there was any kind of public feedback that was provided during the uh, City of Greeley hearing process uh, that um, needed to be addressed by the operator through the process? We can turn that over to uh, Stephanie Madrin. Yeah, so there wasn't um, leading up to the hearing. There was no comment from the public. There was a stakeholder who showed up to the planning commission and spoke about his frustrations about traffic. Um, and that was the his concern when he approached. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And um... You know, again, this the, the, I think I explained the reasons that I'm asking this at hearing. Um, the other piece, and this is a question for you, Mr. Wells. Um, you, you said the words that, that make me do this, um, which is when talking about ozone uh, measures during uh, mitigation measures during high ozone days, uh, you use the words when feasible, which again, for me, you can't say, we're gonna do all of these things and then say when feasible, um, because to me, that just means that you're not gonna do any of those things. Um, and so I wonder if you could add a little specificity as to either what your determination is to determine feasibility associated with the specific BMPs um, that are associated with high ozone days, um, or maybe revise your statement to um, not utilize the words when feasible. Yeah, yeah I understand. So we are committing to over 40 BMPs that you know, the CDPHE consult, consultation you know, had. Uh, when feasible, you know, there's sometimes when you know, operation tests a fuel vehicle or they get stranded out there or something of that nature, that's just where the feasible comes through. Um, we're committing to those BMPs, um, but we know there might be some rare instance where you know, something has to occur, but no, we're committed to the high ozone action day uh, BMPs uh, as, as they're stated. Okay, uh, thank you for answering my questions. Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would agree that I uh, appreciate the quality of this application. Thank you. And thank you for the uh, multiple personnel on the uh, call as well. It's uh, nice to have folks that are able to, to detail to answer each question. I wanted to uh, go back to the drilling schedule a little bit. We can certainly pull up that slide if we need to, but uh, not imperative. Um, and I had a question on the, it looks like we don't have a continuous occupation on the Shmuri, and so I wanted to uh, ask about the uh, break between drilling to completion. Looks like six to eight weeks of drilling, um, and then the schedule, though, shows uh, a break between February and September, a seven-month break, uh, well, a five-month break if you take eight weeks to, to drill. Um, can you talk a little bit about why the multiple occupations on the Shmurgi? I, I certainly have an idea, but want to see if uh, you can elaborate a little bit. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I can turn over, um, I believe I can turn that to you, either Corey Altenberg or Chris Honest to answer from the completions or the drilling side. And I will pull up the schedule on our end. Uh, our, our general goal is to drill the wells and get in and complete as quickly as reasonable. Um, obviously, that's a benefit for a lot of people and, and includes us from a capital standpoint. Uh, generally, though, we're trying to balance a number of SIMOPs in the area. You don't want to drill and frack at the same time. And so if the rig is in an area that the completion and leaves that pad, but is staying in the area to drill more wells, uh, Corey and his completion team can't come in after our drilling rigs uh, until we finish drilling in the entire area. So that's usually what drives our schedule when you see gaps in that schedule. Uh, we also try to maintain a continuous frack crew. And so they may be wrapping up a bigger pad in some area and it just creates a little bit of gap as they wrap that one up and they get over as quickly as they can to the next pads. Um, but our goal is always to minimize that break uh, as, as reasonably as we can. Thanks for your response on that uh, and the further explanation. I appreciate that. Um, as has been detailed by my fellow commissioners, I think really, really one of the primary issues on this is the 604B4 substantially equivalent argument and appreciate you detailing uh, that in your presentation. Can I ask for a little additional detail on that, though? Can you uh, detail a little bit on uh, whether or not informed consent was asked for for each of the four occupants uh, on, of the RVUs on the Vista location? Talk a little bit more about each one and the concerns associated with each uh, uh, RBU, and uh, specifically, if you have the information, why informed consent was not uh, given. Certainly, Commissioner Ackerman, uh, I'd like to turn it over again to Stephanie Madrid to describe her conversations with those stakeholders. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm happy to go into a little more detail. So um, just in general, we always share the process of how we get to when we get to a new location. So what that looks like from when we're submitting the applications to um, steps that take that happen at local government level, that happen at the state level, and what opportunities they have to be involved along the way. So we always discuss um, the idea of informed consent. Um, however, our conversations with stakeholders are not driven by that piece. So we're guided by how they want to take the conversation. So our top priority is to answer questions that they have and address concerns that they might have. Um, and again, we talk about that, but that is not the driving force in those conversations. Um, so for the, um, sorry, I'll speak to Vista because it's up. So for the Vista location, um, as mentioned before, that stakeholders top concerns, really um, frustration around the growing of the area, just more people in the area and some frustration, frankly, with the development that's planned in there um, and the growing just number of trucks driving by. So many of our conversations have been about that. We have also had conversations because there are so many um, existing locations in the area, we've had conversations about those, um, how he might access information um, that we can't provide him. So if he has questions about an existing well that is owned by another operator, how he might access that on the ECMC website, um, things like that. And um, just to note on the Schmervy location, we had conversations, again, grading was his top um, concern that he wanted more information about when we met in person. And he was able to speak to our subject matter expert who could speak to the, the techni technicalities of it, I couldn't speak to that level. Um, but all of his um, questions and concerns were addressed. Thank you for your responses. Um, nothing further, Mr. Chair, thanks. Questions, further questions? All right, uh, as is normally the case, I believe the commissioners did a good job of flushing out the application with qu questions. I do want to thank uh, the applicant um, for the uh, presentation today. I, th I think it was, uh, it, it tried to address in a 
I thought a very good way uh, the relevant issues before the commission. There's a lot of information and I too appreciate having everyone here before us um, so that we can ask questions. Um, with that, uh, we would turn to deliberations. Does anyone desire to start deliberating? Commissioner Ackerman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And once again, thank you to the uh, operator. Um, I, I've certainly found this operator in my time on the commission to uh, be best in class with regard to best management practices and other things that they do on each of their uh, sites, whether there are concerns or not. And so I wanna recognize the good work that uh, Kermagee does. Um, I, you know, in this application, the intent is to PNA 18 wells within a year of approval and six associated facilities and to reclaim, I had it at 15.3 acres, but I think another figure came up leaving a seven net acres uh, no storage of oil on location, piped hydrocarbons, and a number of other best management practices that we've come to expect from Kermagee, but are of note uh, over and above what is required by a number of our regulations. I wanted to say that I do support Commissioner McGowan's suggestion to centralize water pickup from the Smurgy location, if possible. I think that's a great idea um, and certainly can minimize the traffic on the location that is most impactful to uh, homeowners or excuse me, R RBU occupants within 2000 feet of the pad. As evidenced by my questions, you know, I don't like multiple operations or multiple, excuse me, occupations if they can be avoided. I do understand the intricacies of trying to manage large scale fleets and move from pad to pad, particularly on these multi-well pads and uh, appreciate the operator's explanation of how they're trying to minimize breaks between uh, the industrial operations to get pads up and running. And I do prefer a multiple operation on the Smurgy over the Vista, which is uh, it looks like that's uh, what they have planned. In general, I'm reluctant to approve OGDPs under 604B4. Uh, I think that you know when we had the setbacks discussion, I wasn't on the commission at the time, but significant interest in protecting uh, the 2000 foot buffer to RBUs. Again, um, as I've mentioned, this operator has a track record of best in class BMPs. I do feel like the BMPs and practices that were offered in this application uh, provide a good argument for approval um, under 604B4. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the, the deliberative thoughts, Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you to the applicant for the presentation today and for Commissioner Ackerman for leading off. Um, I'll, I'll just start off saying I, I'm in agreement with Commissioner Ackerman. I think that this is this is a good application. This was a well done application. Um, a few of the things that stuck out to me aside from from what was mentioned by Commissioner Ackerman, um, some of the steps that the applicant is taking to make sure that they minimize impacts that really stick out to me especially the four four mile lateral i I, th I think is you know if effective is is impressive it's a way to minimize the number of wells as was discussed i think it's a good way to cut down on the drilling time cut down on the completions time um cut down on emissions that way cut down on surface impacts i i think that's a great step um and and kind of as they talked about pushing the boundaries of of what operators are doing and can do. I, I know I don't remember seeing a four mile lateral in any of our applications to date, um, but hopefully if if this is successful, we start to see more um, three, four mile laterals to do those minimization um, of impacts. Um, another thing that stuck out to me is, as, as discussed, and I think it's come up several times in recent hearings, is the idea of, what if we can't electrify? Um, and from the get-go, what we're seeing with with Oxy here is them saying, if we can't electrify, we're going to do the very next best thing. They're committing to the very next best things. Um, I know we've had some, we'll say, consternation in some of the past ones of, well, you're saying you're hoping to do this, but what if you can't get that rig? Um, and then we kind of have to pull teeth to say, are we going to get dual fuel? Are we going to get natural gas? Are we going to get the battery? And right away here, the applicant is saying, you know, we're not sure we're going to have the capacity or the ability to get electrified rigs in here. 
And so therefore, right away, we're going to we're going to have natural gas. We're going to have the battery storage to minimize emissions as best we can if electrification is not possible. Um, similarly, doing the same thing, the dual fuel comp completions and tier four rigs for um, for the completions. I think that's that's a great step forward. Um, and then one of the other things that I really wanted to talk about that stuck out with me just in the presentation itself that was done very well is the alternative location analysis. And as I scroll down to, to some of the slides here, a couple of the things that stuck out to me is number one, talking about here's why certain locations are not feasible. So when you look at the Schmurgi location, talking about the fact Yes, we are doing four mile laterals. And so if you're having a, a, a step out from the alternative one here, that's going to be nearly a mile to do that, you are gonna strand resources. We're gonna come up with other problems, um, technologically not feasible. And even beyond going into the specific alternative locations that were analyzed in these slides, the applicant also discussed some of the other open areas. And I, and I think that that's something that, again, has come up in some of our previous hearings of people are saying, well, it looks like there's some open area over here. Why wasn't that done? So when, when the applicant talked about the Vista location, there's a couple areas to the south that they talked about and specifically went into, listen, we weren't able to do some of these um, because of land issues, because of proximity to um, additional RVUs, et cetera, and, and even beyond what was analyzed in detail, talking about why some other alternatives were not um, able to be used here. Um, so I, I found that helpful as well for the presentation. Um, overall, I, you know, I think that this was very well done in going through and talking about specifically under our rules, why they meet all of the specific requirements under 604B4 as to why substantial equivalence is met here. Um, talking about great BMPs to make sure that it's done, we're looking at reclaiming more land than's going to be disturbed in it. We're plugging a lot of wells, we're lowering emissions. I, I think overall, there's a lot of good things to this. A couple side notes. Um, I know as I talked to staff, um, one of the things that came up was the, the filing of the synopsis. Um, to, to kind of lay out how, how 604B4 is met. Um, and I know that staff found it helpful to do this. And, and I think that it was a good way to not necessarily rely on the applicant, but a good way to, to set it forth. And so I, I think that putting forth some kind of synopsis in a clear and concise way, not, not just reiterating everything that's, that could potentially be in there, but summarizing what's in there is, was helpful. And, and I think a good way to present the benefits and the, the applicability under substantial equivalence that was done here. Um, and aside from that, I, I think one other thing, I obviously I understand the, the naming of the Schmurgi location. Um, I, in the Vista, I'm not sure how they did, but calling it the flower of OGDP, I didn't quite understand. I, um, I'd be interested in just kind of knowing where they come up with some of the names for that as well. But, um, overall, I think that this is an approvable location, um, and, and I would be in support of it. Thank you, Commissioner Cross. Further deliberative thoughts? Commissioner McGowan? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't have anything to add that my fellow commissioners haven't said. And of course, Commissioner Ackerman for me always says it best, so I like it when he goes before me. Um, I would just say, if there's any, you know, it seems to me that the last piece here there, there was appropriate community engagement. People don't have to sign informed consent. They know what our process is. They could have participated today. Um, but one individual did make sure to go to the Greeley process and express concerns about traffic. So I, I'm hoping that the operator is going to continue to look at and work on what traffic is going to look like for the neighbors in the Vista, um, for the Vista application. But I, I think that there are other things that are, um, uh, appropriate for approval here in the application. I think that, you know, but for electrification, what they're proposing for drilling is minimizing emissions. Um, we're plugging wells in the same area. So that's a benefit to those residents who are living there and exposed to other activities. 
Um, I like that we're using the group three drilling mud, so we're minimizing odor for those folks who are going to be in proximity to the activity. Um, and I appreciate um, the best management practices that the operator has put forward to try to to prove up the 604B4. Mr. Messner. Um, thanks. I, I'm just going to mention a couple of things. I do think that the application um, meets the rules and requirements um, and uh, is approvable. I think there's two things I just want to highlight. One is um, that continuing to push technology and utilizing four mile laterals, I think is a huge step forward and appreciate the operator doing that. It minimizes surface disturbance uh, and all the associated um, conflicts with receptors associated with surface locations, um, you know, throughout this particular area. So continue to, would love to continue to see that technology be pushed and, and utilized. Um, and so I'm appreciative of that. Um, what was the tipping point for me in a 604B4 review um, and, and, and really is an important piece for me is that local government disposition and particularly the city of Greeley where the primary, uh, which was what the primary location um, of the RBUs inside 2000 feet. The use by special right review at the local government level, um, similar to uh, planned unit developments, um, are, are thorough um, processes that involve a lot of opportunities for um, public input and stakeholder processes, planning commissions um, at the local government level um, that are reviewing these things are uh, often you know a very diverse cross-section of that community in which these um, activities or applications may be located uh, and um, you know understanding the level of review that these go through at the local government level and how they tie into local government master planning um, uh, I think is important in the fact that a planning commission which is different than a city council which is you know uh, has political influences as well. Um, planning commissions truly uh, are uh, a cross section of the community and reviewing land use stuff. And so I'm appreciative of a, um, a unanimous uh, approval at the planning commission level of a use by special right for this particular location. And so to me, that was very compelling. Um, and so uh, I would move approval of this OGDP application. Thank you, Commissioner Messner. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will second, but I would, um, if possible, I know that uh, stat, or that the operator responded a little bit to Commissioner McGowan's suggestion, maybe to centralize water pickup. I know that this is, uh, you know, a little bit, a uh, little bit kind of on the spot. But uh, do, do they have any, any thoughts on the initial feasibility of potentially piping produced water from the Vista to the Shmurgi for centralized pickup? Ms. Wazlinki? Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Ackerman. Um, I'd have to confer with um, Kerr McGee here. I know they said that was not evaluated for the application that's before you today. Um, so, Mr. Wells, I don't know if you have any other thoughts to that, but I, I do believe. Um, that alternative was not obviously put forth um, for what's in front of you for approval today. Mr. Wells? Yes, it would need to be evaluated at a much deeper level, um, not only for our facilities, uh, but also our surface land team. So I can't make comment towards that now. We'd have to evaluate that further. Just as a suggestion, Commissioner Ackerman, um, could we include in the motion or and, and or Commissioner Messner you know, that Kira McGee pledges to, you know, use best efforts to evaluate. I mean, at the end of the day, um, I don't know that we're in a place to 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 force that today, um, but we could force a, a sincere evaluation. I agree with you, Mr. Chair. Those were my thoughts exactly. If Commissioner Messner is amenable, I would second with an amendment that uh, we ask the operator to examine that uh, potential alternative. 
I'm um, happy to happy to modify the motion. I think it is uh, an, an important um, consideration, um, and certainly would encourage the operator to explore that option, particularly in light of some of the work that the Colorado Produce Water Consortium will be working on, you know, upcoming and uh, evaluating ways to uh, re reuse and recycle produce water and decrease the amount of fresh water utilized in oil and gas activities, and you know, ways to consider um, how ongoing operations might be able to help address this are certainly um, relevant. And so with that, I would modify my motion um, to uh, encourage the operator to explore uh, centralizing produced water um, facilities between the Vista pad to the Schmerg pad or some other alternative that would centralize produced water for ultimate um, trucking in order to reduce truck traffic associated with the RBU owners within 2,000 feet of Vista Pad. Commissioner Ackerman, does your second hold with that change that you asked for? Yes, it does, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm in favor of, of evaluating that consolidation, but I have a couple concerns, chief among them that is this something that we can then go back and approve later on if they have looked at it or are we just having them look at it? Um, just not clear if it's if it's something being considered or something mind, that they're gonna do. And I would look to A.G. Mercer, in my mind, it is a uh, ask for a sincere evaluation of this uh, change in terms of where the water is gonna be trucked from. And if it happens, then I think they would file a sundry with staff and and move forward. I, I, I as one commissioner, don't need to hear it again. I, you know, would love an update from staff, uh, just as I would love an update from Oxy on their pledge that if they find electricity in the area, they're going to electrify. That you know, that's one of the things that I appreciate with this operator and with some of our other operators is that you know they're 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 pledging to do what they can that's feasible now, but they also are making sincere, I think, uh, suggestions that if things get better, then they're going to do even better. And I appreciate that and would love to hear back and find out how, how it went. Um, but as to the, the trucking piece, in my mind, it's just go give it a, you know, good sophomore try. And if it works, let staff know about it. I, I don't need to hear the application again, but that's just me, Commissioner Cross. And and I'm fine with that as well. I just wanted to, as as I said, I just want to make sure is this something that that we're going to be expecting, or just wanting to understand how it's done. Um, and again, as you as you noted, I I saw that AAG Mercer um, visualized herself, so she may have an answer for us too. AAG Mercer. Thank you, commissioners. Um, so yes, I did want to just chime in here. Um, as I understand the motion, um, Chair Robbins. Uh, summarize it accurately, that it would be requiring um, for McGee to do a, a good faith evaluation of this option, um, not sort of imposing any substantive requirements beyond that. Um, I did also want to flag that if um, Kerr McGee were to evaluate and determine that, yes, it's feasible and they would like to um, consolidate or, you know, pipe the water and, and truck from a consolidated location, that would require changes to the Form 2A and the associated attachments and plans um, and, and somewhat significant changes to the OGDP. Uh, we do have a process for that under Rule 301C um, that requires, in short, a sundry from the operator, the proposed changed um, OGDP to be posted on the website for a period of time, and then a subsequent sundry once any changes have been made. Um, so our processes do allow for, for this sort of thing. I just also wanted to make commissioners aware of, of the process that goes into it um, and would invite, um, or yeah, I believe that's it, but if there are additional potential complications posed by this approach, it might be appropriate to um, ask staff about that. Okay, uh, thank you for the clarification. Uh, Ms. Wozlinki, we have a motion in a second and we've got sort of a tortured suggested COA. Uh, are you and your client comfortable with the terms of this and what this is gonna look like? Yes, Chair. Um, I believe the COA to make a good faith evaluation on produced water um, makes sense. 
And I do agree um, that there's a process in the rules for amending an OGDP that would come in via form four. Um, so I think between that commitment and the rule language, I think we're in agreement. Okay, great. Is there further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, anybody opposed to the motion say aye. All right, motion carries five to zero. Oh. Uh, the OGDP is approved with the uh, suggested uh, good faith motion. So um, appreciate that. Appreciate um, the work. Uh, I also appreciate the work from staff of putting this together and bringing it to us. Um, that's always kind of behind the scenes and it's not daylighted. And I know it's a ton of work and we really want to um, remind everyone of the fantastic efforts of the ECMC staff on these matters. So, all right, uh, with that, uh, I think it would be appropriate to take a break for lunch. Um, and I would suggest let's come back at one o'clock. That's close to 45 minutes. Um, give everybody a chance to stretch their legs, get some food, and get ready for a hearing this afternoon. See you at one.